this. No. No. Ah. Uh, good morning. Good morning to you all. Welcome to you all for today's session. Before I call esteemed speakers, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that at 10 a.m. in this room, we'll have a high-level segment on mitigating the humanitarian consequences of war, the role of parliaments. This debate is organized with, within the framework of the 75th anniversary of the 1949 Geneva Convention. We will have with high-level speakers the president of the ICRC, the UN specific representative on sexual violence in conflict and a senior representative from UNHCR. There will be time for questions from the floor. So please join this debate at 10 a.m. and encourage other members of your delegations to come as well. Now, we will start with Jamaica, then Sicils, followed by Kenya and Jamaica. So, Jambia, now the floor is yours. You have six minutes. Madam President, some 135 years ago in 1889, two parliamentarians, William Randall Kramer of United Kingdom and Frederick Percy of France, birth the International Parliamentary Union as a platform on which promotion of peace and international arbitration is interrogated by all political system across parliaments. This initiative by these two distinguished parliamentarians was arguably the first step towards parliamentary diplomacy and its attendant role as a center for dialogue and peace as well as advancing international cooperation. It is therefore gratifying to note that on this day and at this time, we are gathered to discuss the topic, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding for the general debate. In my view, this Madam President, allow me to share my reflections on this timely topic. To put context to my statement, I wish to commence by alluding to the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations and the distinguished parliamentarians of over 17 years, Ms. Antonio Guterres, when he said, and I quote, it is widely recognized that there is no peace without development and no development without peace, end of quote. It is important to underscore that peace is the precursor for development and parliamentary dip diplomacy is the catalyst for this. In addition, the United Nations 23rd Agenda for the Sustainable Development has recognized peace and security and as pre to be prerequisites for achieving sustainable development, which in turn provides a pathway for peaceful societies. Despite this recognition, conflict and insecurity continue to escalate in regional hotspots across the globe. The happenings in Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, DRC, the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, to mention but a few, are too ghastly to comprehend, especially within the context of human rights and dignity. This situation was validated by the Global Peace Index of 2023, which indicates that the level of global peacefulness has deteriorated for the ninth consecutive year since 2008. This is a very serious trend which needs immediate interventions. Madam President, with the continued conflicts we are witnessing, it is, very, it is difficult and nearly impossible to achieve the sustainable development goals as set out in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. There is therefore need for collective action and for, to foster peace, understanding, and harmony for sustainable development and, par and parliaments as national forums designed to address contentious issues, relationships, and political disagreement provide this unique platform for promoting conflict resolution through the democratic means of dialogue and compromise. Parliamentary diplomacy brings a distinctive form of diplomacy due to the fact that 
members of parliament have the marginal flexibility that may not be accorded to a conventional diplomat. It is therefore imperative that we mobilize parliaments to use their legislative oversight, budget approval, and representative functions to ensure that all people, including the marginalized, live safely, peacefully, and have access to equal opportunities. Further, parliaments can leverage on the various inter-parliamentary groups, parliamentary committees, and parliamentary support groups as parliamentary diplomatic actors. Madam President, let me brief, briefly share Zambia's experience with regard to parliamentary diplomacy. The government of the Republic of Zambia has demonstrated, has demonstrated commitment to safeguarding peace and maintaining security in the country by which is anchored the, to on implementing a policy and legal framework that promotes peace. From a parliamentary perspective, the Constitution of Zambia mandates the Zambian parliament to ratify international agreements and convention. This has provided a unique opportunity and a means of our parliament to participate in sharing the country's foreign policy. The Zambian parliament is also an active member of various international and regional parliamentary bodies through which matters such as peace building and conflict issues are deliberated upon. As part of efforts to promote peace in the region and beyond, our parliament also participates in election observation missions with the ex recent ones having been undertaken in Kenya and the Democratic Republic of Congo, to mention but a few. In addition, as parliament, we have created an environment where we host high-level foreign dignitaries, such as heads of state and speakers, who are given an opportunity to address our parliament as a low-hanging fruit, enhancing parliamentary diplomacy. The, foreign, uh, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, President of Italy, Mr. Sergio Mattarella, and the President of the Republic of, uh, United Republic of Tanzania, Dr. Samia Sohulu Hassan, have been recently accorded the opportunity to address our parliament on matters of peace and good governance. In the, mean, in the same vein, our parliament, just like many others, has established specific parliamentary committees that provide effective oversight on government policies and governance pertaining to national security, rule of law, and democratic governments, which are building blocks for peace and understanding. The establishment of parliamentary friendship groups with a number of countries to, among other things, foster the exchange of views, best practices, and lessons of mutual parliamentary issues, which include but not limited to peace, security, democracy, and sustainable development, are also evident of our efforts for strengthening diplomatic relations at parliamentary level. Madam President, in our journey to promote parliamentary diplomacy, two key issues have, to, have come to light which need to be addressed in order to strengthen our parliamentary diplomacy as pa pa diplomacy is practiced. Firstly, there is need to ensure greater parliamentary independence, particularly financial independence, in order to address the challenge of political tourism, where parliamentarians only reproduce or tour the original positions of their government. Secondly, and lastly, you agree with me that most parliaments experience high turnovers following parliamentary elections. This leads to inconsistency in the manner in which international matters are dealt with by parliamentarians, especially that parliamentary diplomacy, through, though important, is not the main realm of parliamentary work. Therefore, there is need to develop administrative mechanism of ensuring consistency and continuity in the manner in which parliaments deal in international relations. Madam President, let me conclude by reiterating the fact that parliamentary diplomacy Please is a powerful Lord. tool for engaging in global affairs, shaping foreign pro policy, Please and fostering peaceful Please. international relations. In this regard, allow me to call upon all parliamentarians to utilize their valuable avenues to engage in parliamentary diplomacy as a viable means for resolving conflict and building bridges, peace and understanding. Thank you very, very much for, under, for, for your attention. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Now I'll invite Cecils, followed by Lynchenstein, and after Lynchenstein, Fiji. Mr. President, colleagues and delegates present, thank you very much for turning up at this early hour to give uh, me an audience. Democracy is not perfect, but it is a principle we are committed to and we have to accept its limitations 
and make it work as best as we can. In the case of emergency items yesterday, we have fallen short. We will once again be unable to send a clear message on an issue of great concern to the world today. The saddest thing is that it is not because we disagreed on the fundamental issue. It is simply on how it should be presented. There was more common ground than differences in the positions taken yesterday. But we failed to embrace the common ground and instead allowed the differences to divide us. It is a sobering thought that if we cannot compromise on the wording of a statement, how do we expect warring parties who are focused on their vital interests to compromise for peace? There is also an issue of rules. Is the two-thirds majority for the adoption of an item reasonable? Or should negotiations be allowed to continue after two competing proposals with common ground have not been accepted? These are things to consider to break the stalemate that we are likely to face year after year. For now, we must accept that our failure to agree is the outcome of a democratic process, but that doesn't mean that we have to give up. The conflicts that are ravaging our world today have a disastrous impact on many people who are directly in the way. They also affect each and every one of our countries and our people, big or small, wherever we are and they even represent an existential threat to humanity. I come from a small island country which has no part in the causes of these various conflicts, but we have been seriously affected by the two conflicts that dominate international attention today. That is the war in Ukraine and the war in Palestine. But while I refer to these two, I do not want to put aside the other areas of conflict, especially those in our own African region, notably the persisting strife in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the devastating civil war in Sudan. As individual countries, we just don't have the means to make an impact on the resolution of these wars. And we have seen that not even the most august international organization, the United Nations, has the capacity to enforce any kind of conclusive solution. But if countries cannot make any difference individually, the hope must rest in collective action. As the most vibrant global parliament network, the IPU is a source of hope, a voice that must be strengthened and an effort that must be sustained and amplified. We all know the United Nations has made numerous valiant efforts towards resolution of the ongoing conflicts, but unfortunately, they have not been enough. The efforts have been impaired by polarization across the geopolitical divide east and west. It seems that no conclusive proposal can receive consensus and unanimous support. Unfortunately, we have fallen into the same pattern. The outcome yesterday is a classic example of the north-south divide. We have to get over this. I want, therefore, to support the call for the IPU to engage more consistently and persistently in conflict resolution around the globe. It can establish another and different channel of communication to engage with parties in conflict. Saying this, I want to commend what has been done already, and in particular, the recent efforts by our new president, Dr. Tulia Axon, to engage with parties in the ongoing conflicts. It is an effort that must continue and be strengthened in parallel with and complementary to the efforts of the United Nations and the efforts of countries such as Qatar and Egypt in relation to the war in Palestine. We must make the IPU a stronger force in conflict resolution across the globe. And here I want to mention again the conflicts in Africa, notably in Congo and in Sudan. I would argue, I would urge that conflict resolution should be the focus of such new efforts guided by the distinct approach to diplomacy that the IPU is best placed to undertake. There is scope for a high-level body in the IPU to focus consistently on conflict resolution efforts. At least the proposals contained in the resolutions on emergency items presented yesterday reflected our desire for the IPU to play a role in resolving these conflicts. We must not abandon this hope. 
The world needs peace. We want our organization to be a stronger force for finding the way to peace. Let us please agree on that and let us find the means. I thank you. Thank you. Now, now I'll invite Lichtenstein, followed by Fiji. Honorable Fiji speaker will speak from his seat, followed by Tonga. So, Lichtenstein now. Mr. President, Madam Secretary, dear colleagues, <clears throat> I thank the Interparliamentary Union for their leadership and hospitality in convening the 148th Interparliamentary Union Assembly. Building bridges for peace. Worldwide, there are far too many conflicts raging. They are characterized by a widespread disregard for the human life. To counter this trend, national parliaments have an important role to play. They should be guided by the respect for the international obligations which bind us all. And they should speak up much more often whenever serious human rights violations and atrocity crimes are committed. The promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies is a cornerstone of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 2030 Agenda is also dear to our Parliament's heart. For example, every proposal to Parliament includes an SDG impact section. By doing so, we put the SDGs front and center in our parliament, parliamentary debates. Another important parliamentary tool for building sustainable peace is our budget authority. In light of the far too many worrying conflicts around the world, the Liechtenstein parliament has significantly increased the budget of Liechtenstein's international humanitarian cooperation and development. This reflects our Parliament's commitment to strengthen Liechtenstein's international solidarity. As a result, we spent last year more than 7 million Swiss francs on projects related to SDG 16 on peaceful and inclusive societies. By so doing, we ensure that there is less fertile ground for conflicts. The promotion of human rights, democracy and the rule of law are core values of the Council of Europe. During Liechtenstein's presidency of the Council of Ministers, Liechtenstein is working tirelessly to strengthen these principles. They are also safeguarded and indeed adjudicated by the European Court for Human Rights, the crown jewel of the human rights system on the European continent. In so doing, the Court guarantees that Europe remains a continent of democratic societies governed by the rule of law. We must therefore do our utmost that the Member States of the Council of Europe ensure the full, effective and prompt execution of all judgments of the court. Liechtenstein is not only a strong supporter of the Council of Europe and its bodies, but also of the International Criminal Court, ICC. Given the countless violations of international criminal law, it is of paramount importance that parliamentarians speak up much more often in favor of the ICC and advocate for ensuring that perpetrators of international criminal law are brought to justice. Let me assure you that Liechtenstein will continue, continue conversations to achieve this goal, which is vital for the sake of a just peace in international conflicts and for the sake of our international legal order. 
The Security Council has the primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security. Yet we are time and again frustrated by its inability to do so. I am thus proud that Liechtenstein has spearheaded the so-called Veto Initiative, which activates the United Nations General Assembly whenever a veto is cast in the Security Council. The Veto Initiative is therefore a significant step towards protecting the role of the United Nations and maintaining international peace and security, which is of crucial importance, especially for small states. Mr. President, working towards building sustainable peace requires a comprehensive response from all of us. We should always put people first and strongly support initiatives that build bridges for peace, strengthen the rules-based order, and ensure accountability for the most serious crimes under international law. I thank you. Thank you. Now I'll invite Honorable Fiji speaker. He will speak from his seat, followed by Tonga, and after Tonga, Afghanistan. So now Fiji will have floor. Thank you. Please press the mic. Thank you, Nisham Bulabinaka, Honorable Chair, and uh, Madam President of the 148th Assembly, Honorable Speakers and Members of Parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure and an honor as the Speaker of the Fijian Parliament, a small island state in the Pacific, to address this august assembly of the global community of parliaments and parliamentarians. I strongly agree with the notion that building bridges for peace and stability is not only about resolving or preventing conflict, but rather it is about understanding each other and, and creating a social inclusion, an important condition for progressive and sustainable livelihoods for our people. Individuals and communities, irrespective of their gender, age, ethnicity, and so forth, must be given all the opportunity to participate in society. Parliaments and parliamentarians, therefore, have a fundamental role in fostering dialogue, taking legislative action and effective oversight to ensure social inclusion. We have the power to address polarization along political, socioeconomic, gender, ethnic, cultural, and religious lines. I wish to share some actions being undertaken by the Fijian Parliament as part of our wider national efforts to build a peaceful and harmonious society. The development of our island state has been adversely impacted by political upheavals in our post-independence period. In 2014, Fiji returned to parliamentary democracy after eight years without a parliament and with citizens' trust in governance institutions being fragmented, fragile, and at, all, and at an all-time low. We are now on a path of strengthening parliamentary democracy and restoring people's trust in our parliamentary system, taking incremental but decisive steps towards social inclusion and peace building in our communities. In September last year, our parliament passed a motion to establish the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to facilitate truth-telling dialogue. The, and the reconciliation on our past political conflicts since 1987, which included four coups and uh, dictatorial governments. We believe that the parliament must take the lead role in national healing and reconciliation. Since this current parliament uh, first, uh, first convened in December 2022, and as speaker, I have encouraged an inclusive and participatory process whereby parliamentarians from both the government and the opposition are actively involved in interparliamentary engagements 
and bipartisan approaches. A good example is our leader of the opposition, sitting beside me here, now being part of our regular delegation to all IPU assemblies. And his election as chair of the Small Island Development States Parliamentary Group at the 147th IPU Assembly. We are encouraging stronger bipartisanship on matters critical to Fiji's nation building and sustainable development at all levels, national, regional, and international. In 2023, we introduced the use of the vernacular in our parliament, making parliament more accessible and inclusive to all Fijians and ensuring that their participation in parliamentary processes is not hindered by language barriers. Parliamentarians have the option of speaking in their own vernacular and giving representatives the ability to get their information and messages across to their constituents and allow non-English speaking citizens to better understand parliamentary debates and procedures. This has been made possible through the strengthening of our e-parliament initiative which also supports <coughs> our civic engagement work. Honorable Chair, Fiji is a small island developing state, better known as SEEDS, in the large Pacific Ocean, is facing the rising challenges imposed by the adverse impacts of climate change with rising temperatures and sea levels. In 1992, at the Rio Global Summit in Brazil, we as SEEDS were accorded the global recognition of being the most vulnerable group of 39 countries in the UN family of nations. Since Rio, the existential uh, threats uh, have exacerbated and its impacts have not only adversely affected seeds, but also by other developing countries with small population and economies, threatening our peaceful existence. Honorable Chair, you may wonder why I'm bringing this critical issue in our discussion, in our discourse today. Climate change can be the biggest threat to peace and security. It is a global problem that calls for global solutions. We are therefore convinced that parliaments and parliamentarians through the IPU have a critical role in our global discourse to advocate against the threats of climate change and help shape the adaptation and resilience building narratives into our respective countries and member states of the IPU's long-term sustainable development. The Fijian parliament therefore believes in a stronger interparliamentary dialogue on this matter, including uh, conflict uh, prevention and peace building. In this context here in Geneva, we seek your support in investing time and resources to effectively address the scourge of climate change. Our interparliamentary commitments with the IPU, the CPA, and our regional parliamentary networks in the Pacific with Australia and New Zealand, and our senior neighbors are a useful platform to contribute to our co collective global efforts. Despite being a small parliament, Fiji values this commitment for all our IPU members and concurs that the parliaments play a legitimate role in intergovernmental efforts to promote conflict prevention, peace building, and long-term security at all levels. In conclusion, I remain adamant that when parliamentarians and parliaments take a well-defined concerted action at home to foster dialogue and facilitate social inclusion, they are in a stronger position to do the same at the international level where parliamentary democracy can contribute to peace building and security. Honorable Chair, the role of parliaments and parliamentarians are increasingly moving beyond traditional legislative, oversight, and representative functional roles into broader responsibility at all levels. Through parliament initiated, uh, initiated dialogue, diplomacy and innovative peace building initiatives, we can advocate with our own national governments to effectively please, address please the conclude, scourge of climate change. Please conclude. Honorable Speaker, please conclude. For our long-term sustainable uh, livelihoods and development. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. <coughs> now I'll invite Tonga. After Tonga, Afghanistan will have its floor. Honourable Chair, Honourable Speakers of Parliament, Heads of Delegation and Members of Parliament, Ladies and Gentlemen. Honourable Chair, I'm extremely honoured to attend this 148th IPU Assembly in Geneva 
on behalf of the Legislative Assembly of Tonga, a small island developing state. On the theme of parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding, I wish to highlight, like many of my fellow speakers before me, the greatest threats to peace and understanding, and that is geopolitical conflict and climate change inaction. In opening my remarks, I acknowledge that the absence of total peace in our time is due to the persisting unilateral acts of violence and violations of international law by both state and non-state actors, often with impunity due to a lack of accountability within our existing international rules-based order. The double standards witnessed in the treatment of perpetrators of violence supported by states that turn a blind eye to the realities on the ground and double standards undermines our collective will and ambition for lasting peace. Evidently, one can conclude the existing mechanisms and pledges for peace and security enshrined in the United Nations Charter are grossly inadequate today as we slip into a time of multiple conflict across the nations. I commend, like my former speaker from Liechtenstein, the initiative for the veto in the United Nations. In framing the call for peace, I recall the United Nations declaration in 1984 on the right of people for peace, and I quote, appeals to all states and international organizations to do their utmost to assist in implementing the right of peoples to peace through the adoption of appropriate measures at both the national and international level, end quote. We as parliamentarians have a sacred duty to uphold peace for our people through resolutions within our parliaments and in holding our governments to accountable for their actions. However, our peace is not only under constant threat by geopolitical conflict, causing loss and damage to both public and private property, but by forced migration, death and suffering, also by climate change induced extreme weather events felt across the globe, brought about by human activity of releasing harmful greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. Honorable Chair and fellow delegates, our planet is heading towards an unprecedented trajectory of self-destruction. And as leaders of our governments and parliaments, we are partly to be blamed. Whereas I place my trust in the democratic systems designed to protect our nations and people from harm, it is wavering. A lack of international ambition and commitment will result in a global temperature overshooting the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels this year. Fellow de delegates, are we capable of saving ourselves from future hardships? The planet is changing in front of our very eyes. The time to act is imminent and it is before it's too late. Last year was a year of records, all for the wrong reasons. It was the warmest year ever recorded in history. We saw unprecedented heating of our oceans, accelerated sea level rise, the worst glacial retreat on record, the largest loss of Antarctic sea ice, drought afflicted millions, flooding afflicted millions, and these records are only the beginning of what is exceedingly more frequent and will be more severe in the years to come if we do not act now. What can we do as parliaments? In closing, I propose two actions. One, promote the urgent decarbonizing of our energy systems into renewable or, in it, or nuclear. Part of the challenge with the widespread adoption of renewables is the subsidized cost of fossil fuels with our own tax dollars, obscuring the true cost of coal, gasoline, diesel, and gas. In 2022, according to an IMF study, there was a total of $7 trillion in fossil fuel subsidies. Taxpayers funding fossil fuels both explicitly and implicitly
And this number is expected to rise in the coming years if we do nothing. The true cost of the resulting air pollution is estimated at 8 million deaths a year. The direct cost to health is $2 to $4 billion a year. However, we as policymakers are ignoring the true cost of negative externalities to the environment, negative externalities to people's lives, and also the impact on curbing sustainable development. Therefore, my second recommendation this morning, we must phase out all fossil fuel subsidies and phase in the pricing of externalities so that the markets can respond appropriately by realizing the true value of our environment, the true value of human health. Only then can we reach a global consensus on putting a real value on nature. Will political will finally act and align with climate action? I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, before I invite Afghanistan, here is an update. After the Taliban takeover in 2021, there is no functioning parliament in Afghanistan. In a sign of solidarity, the IPU governing bodies have decided to continue to engage with the former freely elected parliament. And now, former speaker of Afghanistan will have floor after Afghanistan, East African Legislative Assembly, and then followed by Latin American and Caribbean Parliament will have their flow. Please, Afghanistan. Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salam arz me daram khidmat huzar girami wa tamam shrakandagan yaksad chalashmin majmei tadib bain parlamani. Khanum Rais, Khanum Hawa Qayyam. Jai basa khushi wa musaratas. که امروز یک بار دیگر به نمایندگی از مردم افغانستان در این جلسه مهم مجمع بین پارلمانی جهانی اشراک می نمایم. برگزاری چنین نشست هایی که پیامد آن تحکیم روابط بین دول سازمان های پارلمانی و نمایندگان مجلس می شود از احمد و ارزشمند خاص دار است. Uh, independent parliamentary uh, institution in a country uh, will uh, actually uh, secure democracy. They are the voice of the people of the country. And it, uh, they show the will of the people of that country. One of the most fundamental concepts of this, these kinds of uh, events is uh, establishing uh, uh, cordial relations among various nations and having fruitful discussions and common efforts for strengthening democracy based on common values among various countries. And also we hope that these events will bring about uh, peace and security and uh, um, investment opportunities and cooperation for uh, safeguarding uh, common uh, uh, values and uh, we, 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 can, we, we, will, uh, we hope that we can put an end to the proxy wars today. The world is ch uh, challenging, uh, facing new challenges. This is an opportunity for us today to uh, protect my, uh, uh, my, my people and be vo the voice of my people, especially women. Afghanistan, during the past 20 years, uh, through a kind of emerging democracy with the efforts of Afghanistan people, especially women, and with the help of the international community, uh, had better uh, uh, situation. And with uh, some you know, uh, popular institution like parliaments, we can provide good opportunities for investment. Unfortunately, with the advent of a Taliban, the uh, various uh, departments have been dissolved, and we are the only country without any constitution. And 
our country is in a state of limbo. So the role of people have been uh, destroyed. And it's, it's the ruling party which uh, governs the people. Uh, the people have no right. Uh, uh, and also referring to the Doha meeting, I would like to thank the organizers of that meeting. When uh, the special reporter for Afghanistan uh, would be appointed so that uh, intra-Afghan talks will be initiated. And also we want women to sit at the uh, negotiation table to decide for themselves. We don't want the current situation where women are not allowed to participate because of their gender. Afghan people have the right to have a constitution. And I hope that uh, we will be able to receive the support of other countries. The people of Afghanistan, especially women, should not be left alone. And I request all of you to host a real representative of Afghan people to your event so that they can uh, convey their own voice. Uh, the, the noble people of Afghanistan support uh, such international events. And once again, we express our gratitude to the organizers of this conference. And I request that the issue of uh, gender apartheid uh, should be considered uh, seriously so that the rights of the I mean, the fundamental rights of uh, people of Afghanistan would be, uh, would be safeguarded. Thank you for your attention. East African Legislative Assembly, followed by Latin American and Caribbean Parliament. Thank you. <laughs> Madam President of the IPU, Right Honorable Dr. Tuli Axon, speakers and heads of delegation here present, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, it's my pleasure and gratitude to speak at the 48th IPU conference. Madam President, I take this opportunity to congratulate you for steering the IPU at this important time when it is coordinating various efforts to make our world more responsible, livable, peaceful, and economically viable. Secondly, I extend warm greetings from the East African District Assembly. Allow me to appreciate all the courtesies from the IPU and the government of Switzerland with regard to the object of the 148th conference, IALA is firmly committed to cause of the IPU and the term parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. The term not only reflects issues that are affecting the globe, the globe but also our communities in the East African region issues which top the agenda and call for greater interest and action. Madam President, armed conflicts continues to afflict many parts of our world, including the East African region, particularly in the Great Lakes region. We are talking of DRC and surrounding countries like Somalia and Sudan, Clearly, the conflicts are resource-based, mostly because of scarcity, greed, the desire for control, economical inequality, and discrimination of marginalized groups. Sadly, again, one can trace the root of such conflicts to major world powers 
whose desire is to plant our resources while the local citizens fight against each other to sustain them. Therefore, as parliamentarians, we know that every conflict, there are two sides, and our best should be to escalate dialogue as a catalyst for peaceful coexistence. And yes, we know the causes then, we can push protocrate initiatives to end conflicts. We are gifted with parliamentary privilege to undertake our work of legislation, oversight, representation, and budgetary allocations. We also must take advantage of establishing specialized caucuses to empower special interests and modernized groups, women, men, youth, as the case may be. Specific to the East African Peace Assembly, our work has been cut out because our region aspires to be a prosperous, competitive, secure, stable, and politically united East Africa. And we have in place laws, manuals, and policies that seek to prevent conflicts, such as the ESC Protocol on Peace and Security, EAS Regional Strategy for Peace and Security, and ESC Protocol of Defense. We also have in place mechanisms for the establishment of a standby force to intervene in pattern states with conflicts as way of empowering citizens, IALA has also taken the lead to adopt resolutions for action by the Council of Ministers on matters such enhanced gender equality in access to food and nutrition, recognizing the women's caucuses as a forum to promote the full participation of women in programs and activities of the community, implementing measures enhance gender mainstreaming, action to prevent trafficking in persons, protect victims of crimes, of crime of trafficking in persons, and prosecution of perpetrators of trafficking in persons in this region. IALA is ever aware that sustainable peace cannot be attained until people feel safe, trust each other, and capable of holding their governments accountable to guarantee their protection and accord them a peaceful and secure environment to live, reside, trade, and travel safe freely. Several activities have, have been undertaken that allowed our region to achieve the following milestones. Establishment of conflict early warming and the response mechanism regional conflicts prevention, management and resolution framework, implementation of small arms and light ammunition initiatives in line with the Nairobi Protocol on Small Arms. Organization of regular joint command posts and field training exercises every two years to enhance interoperationally and armed conflicts, etc. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I conclude by, reaff by reaffirming Yalad's stand in promoting peaceful coexistence and solidarity to regional and world peace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> now the floor will be of Latin American and Caribbean Parliament, please. Thank you, President, uh, distinguished parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to express our solidarity to the Russian victims of the uh, attack uh, just a few days ago, which is an uh, unspeakable act, like any terrorist act. On behalf of the Parliament of Latin America and the Caribbean, I'm delighted that IPU has chosen peace and international security as its strategic focus for 2024. These issues need uh, all of our attention, particularly in our region. 
the summit of uh, the Latin American and Caribbean states that took place in Havana in uh, 2014 proclaimed Latin America and Caribbean a zone of peace. And Paulatina has taken up this mantle. But that doesn't mean that peace and security are completely guaranteed in our countries. We are threatened by intolerance and uh, uh, a failure to accept diversity and uh, xenophobia and hate speech. The increasing uh, inequalities, corruption and organized crime fuel these problems. In a recent meeting of GULAC at these assemblies, various uh, delegations expressed alarm at the ease at which criminal organizations now uh, purchase uh, arms from the United States. According to a report uh, from uh, the UNODC, the main source of uh, illegal firearms in Haiti is the United States, and mainly from Florida. I'd like to take this opportunity to seek uh, parliamentary support for efforts that CARICOM and ECLAC are making to try to support the Haitian people and facilitate a process uh, towards uh, uh, the recovery and, uh, and the development in, the, in, in that state. Other threats to peace and security involve uh, the foreign uh, military presence. There are more than 80 military bases, mainly United States bases, and that is a key factor to take into account as well if you look at uh, military interventions in our countries over history. There are also unilateral coercive measures uh, adopted uh, against the Latin American and Caribbean states without the authorization of the international community and uh, in flagrant violation of international law and the UN Charter. Of course, the main example of which uh, is the financial and economic blockade uh, by the United States government of Cuba, which has now uh, intensified in spite of resolutions by the United Nations General Assembly every year since 1992. In view of that situation, parliamentary dialogue and diplomacy can make a great contribution to consolidation of peace, mediation and the prevention of conflict. However, we shouldn't forget that many of the threats that I've mentioned involve more than one parliament. Once again, change isn't just something that others need to take charge of. We all need to give our commitment to the principles of democracy one of which affirms that any democracy must defend democratic principles in international relations as uh, established uh, in, the United, in, in the Universal Democracy uh, Declaration adopted in Cairo in 1997. Democracy must also be recognized as an international principle and international organizations and states must uh, follow these principles in international relations. And that doesn't just mean equal representation of states. It also means that there must be economic rights and freedoms. The principles of democracy must also apply to international management of international problems and the common heritage of humanity, including uh, the environment. Consistent with the letter and spirit of that declaration, the current challenges for peace, democracy and development and with the principles and objectives contained in the Treaty of Institutionalization of the Latin American and Caribbean uh, Parliament, Palatino has recommended to the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, the celebration of an International Day of Democracy dedicated to the international dimension of democracy and uh, its direct relationship to peace and sustainable development. At the same time, we have asked uh, President Tulia Axon to ensure that IPU also takes on that initiative and uh, tries to submit this to the UN and support the request. Peace and democracy and international relations must go far beyond the Security Council and our incapacity to adopt an emergency item perhaps reflects this lack of democracy as well. Parliamentarians, before concluding, I'd like to indicate our full support for Spanish to be extended uh, and as one of the official languages uh, in the statute of the International Court of Justice. And finally, since we are talking here, many people continue to be victims of atrocities, such as those in Gaza. So once again, please, let's seize this opportunity. Over the past 50 years, we've seen that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is essentially a problem of two peoples who have the right to exist without one of them being exterminated or 
pushed out and parliamentary democracy can still help to save lives and ensure that Palestine can become a sovereign state and exist alongside Israel in peace. So please, let's be real ambassadors of peace. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable delegates, we'll have one more speaker before we go for this high-level segment. I'm, I'm thankful to you. After that, I will request our IPU Honorable President to preside it. So I'll invite Arab Parliament. Let them have and come the, have their flow. Thank you. أصحاب المعالي رأساء البرلمانات ورأساء الوفود البرلمانية الحضور الكريم السلام Distinguished delegates may peace be upon all of you The theme of the general debate of this assembly is of particular significance because the world is undergoing a number of conflicts which are undermining our people's access to resources and really mean that we need to have a genuine culture of peace. We as parliamentarians can play a vital role here. This is particularly possible through parliamentary democracy. We can do what we can in order to ensure that disputes are settled. And this is what our parliament tries to do. Distinguished delegates, we are talking about uh, building bridges for peace. And it, it seems that uh, we are unable to resist the activities of the Zionist entity against women and children uh, in Gaza. They are undergoing, uh, subjected to six months continuously to crimes of genocide and brutal massacres, witnessing all kinds of war crimes, in addition to policies of starvation and slow death against the wounded and injured. The daily statistics no longer monitor just the numbers of martyrs and injured, but also register the, register the number of daily massacres committed against entire families, which reflects the atrocity of terrorist practices perpetrated by the brutal occupation causing the martyrdom of 32,000 civilians, mostly women and children. And this, is also, this crisis has also revealed the scale of international hypocrisy. And we has, this has proved uh, beyond a doubt that the United Nations Security Council is powerless to manage the current international system. This requires radical change if uh, we hope to avoid the law of the jungle prevailing. We condemn the international community's attitude towards uh, what's happening in Gaza. And we wonder what uh, can happen with respect uh, to the terrorist uh, activities being carried out by the occupying entity in Gaza and the occupied territories. How can we talk about the role of our parliamentarian, parliamentary di diplomacy if we uh, are incapable of doing anything about it? We couldn't agree in Angola, and this time in Geneva we have not been able to uh, for the second time, adopt an emergency item to support the cessation of these crimes. We must uh, reflect uh, the uh, views of free peoples who uh, object to these uh, crimes. We have uh, a situation of chaos prevailing. We must bring an end to this war against our Palestinian brothers. Regrettably, there are still among us in this hall those who support the brutal massacres being committed against Pal the Palestinians after six months of killing of uh, these uh, people. This uh, is uh, against human conscience. Uh, the organization that brings together parliaments of uh, all countries must have a clear position 
in order to bring an end to these brutal massacres. We must take a strong position to bring this to an end, and we must uh, reflect the views of our peoples. We need to take a strong stand in order to ensure that we are side by side with those uh, peoples who need our help. Long live uh, Palestine, free and Arab. Thank you for your attention, and may peace be with you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President of the Arab Parliament, um, for having been the last speaker on this segment. But let me also thank our uh, Vice President, who just completed to um, preside on my behalf, India, thank you so much for the good work that you have done. And that said, uh, colleagues, we will now go to our um, high-level segment on the general debate, which is um, about mitigating the humanitarian consequences of war and our role as parliamentarians and as parliaments. So it is a real pleasure for me to now introduce the high-level segment of this general debate, which is entitled Mitigating the Humanitarian Consequences of War, the Role of Parliaments. Colleagues, we are here today and there are more than 100 armed conflicts recorded in the world. The humanitarian consequences created by war persist and are devastating. People are forced to flee their homes and leave their loved ones behind. Women and girls are victims of sexual violence during armed conflict and thousands of civilians continue being victims of indiscriminate attacks. Now, more than ever, it is crucial to abide by the rules of international humanitarian law, refugee law, and human rights law, which afford protection to those affected by armed conflicts. 2024, marks the seven, uh, 75th anniversary of the Geneva Convention of 1949, which are the core international humanitarian law. And we are pleased to mark this anniversary today, gathering parliamentarians from all over the world in Geneva, the birthplace of international humanitarian law, and the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement to discuss how parliamentary diplomacy and action can contribute to mitigating the humanitarian consequences of war through upholding and strengthening the international humanitarian uh, law framework. We have with us very distinguished guests for this high-level segment, which will be di divided into two parts. We will begin first with a discussion on the humanitarian impact of war, in particular with regard to sexual violence in conflict and displaced populations. This first discussion will then be followed by a second part on the role of international humanitarian law in today's conflict. This is to mark the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions. For part one, I am honored to have two distinguished guests representing some of the world's leading organizations working in armed conflict situations and working towards alleviating human suffering caused by it. Ms. Pramila Patton, who is the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict, is here with us but also Ms. Elizabeth Tan, Director of International Protection, Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, on behalf of Mr. Filippo Grandi, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, 
is also here. May I invite the two of you to the podium so that you can address the assembly. I understand we will begin with Ms. Patton, who will address us specifically on the issue of the consequences of sexual violence in war. Ms. Patton, you have the floor. Thank you. Madam President of the Assembly, Mr. Secretary General of the IPU, distinguished parliamentarians, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I commend the, in, the IPU for shining the spotlight on the global humanitarian situation. This event could not be more timely in a context marked by global turbulence as conflicts rage, military coup erupt, human rights trampled, and gender equality gains being reversed. The world is facing a record number of conflicts since World War II, a record number of forcibly displaced persons, 117.2 million, according to UNHCR, more than 600 million women and girls living in conflict-affected countries in 2022, a 50% increase since 2017. Civilians around the world are in need of greater humanitarian aid, with an increase of 25% just over the last year. This is compounded by an unprecedented level of global military expenditure that has exceeded 2.2 trillion US dollars, while funding for urgent humanitarian and protection needs of civilians is shrinking. Conflicts and wars are not gender neutral. While both men and women are affected by conflict, crisis situations have a differentiated impact on them. Modern war warfare is having a devastating effect on the lives and dignity of women and girls, exposing them to heightened risk of violations of their human rights, including sexual violence used as a tactic of war and terrorism. We are seeing new and emerging trends of sexual violence in a context marked by increased militarization and illicit arms proliferation. Food insecurity is another serious emerging concern, which is directly interconnected with the increased risk of exposure to sexual violence, particularly in the context of displacement. From Gaza to Ukraine, the Sudan, Haiti, and Eastern Democratic of Republic of Congo, we see surging physical and food insecurity as a result of conflict and lawlessness. Last year, during a visit to Eastern DRC, I saw firsthand lives shattered by displacement, sexual violence, and acute food insecurity, with women and girls forced into prostitution as a means of survival. Women and girls are being subjected to sexual violence while carrying out livelihood activities around the camps, such as collecting wood or water. These women and girls were confronted with the unacceptable choice between economic subsistence and sexual violence, between their livelihoods and their lives. In Libya, displaced women and girls are reportedly detained by smugglers and transnational criminal networks and forced to exchange sex for food. In Afghanistan, high levels of displacement, poverty, and food insecurity are exacerbating harmful coping mechanisms, including forced marriage. Protection concerns for civilians are also on the rise, including risk of sexual violence and trafficking in a global context where humanitarian access is severely limited and where parties to conflicts target civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, rendering the access to life-saving services for survivors more challenging. In the Sudan, the humanitarian crisis has left more than 9 million of forcibly displaced persons since April 2023. 
with disturbing reports of different forms of sexual violence, including rape, gang rape, and trafficking in persons of women and girls for purposes of sexual exploitation and abuse, sexual slavery, child and forced marriage. In addition, the hostilities have destroyed civilian infrastructure, making access to basic services, including sexual and reproductive health, extremely challenging for those in need. Ladies and gentlemen, the consequences of sexual violence are devastating. It adversely and profoundly affects women's physical, sexual, and reproductive and mental health. The massive and widespread destruction of health facilities in Ukraine is, for example, severely impeding access to life-saving medicines. The World Health Organization has verified more than 1,000 attacks on healthcare facilities in Ukraine since the invasion by the Russian Federation in February of 2022. Such attacks rob entire communities of essential health services that are needed to save lives. In Gaza, we are seeing how the conflict is characterized by acute food insecurity and the decimation of health facilities, in addition to the challenges that humanitarian actors are facing to ensure an adequate supply of assistance. This is resulting in negative consequences for pregnant, nursing, and new mothers, including the unprecedented scale of women reported to have died before or during childbirth. In Haiti, women and girls continue to be subjected to brutal sexual violence while armed gangs have taken over most of the capital and control access to essential resources such as water, food, fuel, and medical services. In Libya, Mali, Myanmar, and the Sudan, service providers, women-led organizations, and women human rights defenders are being threatened with sexual violence by parties to the conflict, limiting survivors' access to life-saving services, protection, and redress. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the proliferation of conflict and widespread insecurity is causing unprecedented suffering and is reversing hard-won progress on women's rights. Yet, this dire picture is not inevitable or irreversible. Civilians need more than our solidarity. They need concerted action and political resolve to ensure their protection. Women are too often excluded from leadership and decision-making roles when it comes to humanitarian responses. I encourage you to use your position as parliamentarians to ensure that women are part of the solution as their needs will remain unaddressed as long as their voices are absent in the design and implementation of humanitarian interventions. The best form of protection is prevention. You know that women have acted as peace mediators in families and societies for generations and have proved instrumental in conflict prevention. You must use your platform to reinforce these skills by taking into account their capabilities and vulnerabilities, by supporting initiatives that offer protection from sexual and gender-based violence, by improving the availability of quality healthcare and reproductive health services, by providing access to education and skills development training, and by providing assistance to income generating and other economic activities for women, you can promote the full participation of women in conflict prevention and post-conflict peace building. In a world facing wars of lethal weapons and wars of territory, we need peace based on the full respect of international humanitarian and human rights law to guarantee justice, dignity, protection, and development for all. This should not be just an aspiration, but your primary goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Patton, and we agree with you that it's very important for us to make sure there's justice and also accountability for all actions that result from sexual violence, which is um, 
caused in the conflict. I would now welcome Ms. Tan. You have the floor. Madam President, thank you for having me here today. I bring High Commissioner Filippo Grandi's regrets for not being here with you this morning due to illness. He was particularly keen to address you and to thank you for putting this topic on the agenda, which in the presence of so many parliamentarians from around the world is a clear demonstration of your commitment to the values not just of the IPU, but to the quest for peace. Madam President, parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, democracy, the power of the people, is at the very heart of the IPU's mission and work. Unfortunately, today we see far too often how the power of the people has been transformed into power used against people. So-called leaders violate, violate human rights to stifle opposition or are quick to war when devastating consequences, including large-scale forced displacement. Today, there are more than 114 million people around the world who have been forced to flee their homes, mostly by conflict. And my first point today is somewhat to preempt the president of the ICRC, what she is likely to say, all parties to conflict around the world must comply with international humanitarian law. If they did, we would certainly have very few refugees. Further to that, it is up to the rest of the world to ensure parties to the conflict adhere to international law. It not only protects civilians and prevents irreparable damage, it also preserves future peace processes. Unfortunately, the conduct of hostilities around the world has gone in the wrong direction. We see this most evidently in the fighting in Gaza, in Ukraine, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where sexual violence, as SRSG Patton has, re has just spoken about, is despicably rampant, and in so many other places. My second point today is that in light of this reality, we must, as an international community, do more to support people in need, including those forced from their homes by violence and human rights abuses. This means financial support and funding from those governments and even individuals with the means. I regret to say that we are falling far short of where we need to be. UNHCR, which is voluntarily funded, receives only 50% of our budget in the best of years. In 2023, we received about $1 billion less than we did in 2022. Yet none of the crises that were ongoing in 2022 have been resolved. And yet another crisis in Sudan exploded. Our financial outlook this year remains even more worrying, with grave human consequences for the displaced, their hosts, and in some cases, the stability of the communities and countries. I therefore appeal in the strongest of terms to all members of parliaments with resources, please do more to fund humanitarian responses around the world. All must also do more to support people forced to flee by ensuring access to territory and the right to seek asylum. I know this can be challenging, but let's not forget that about 90% of the world's forcibly displaced are in low and middle income countries, and they are, by and large, doing all they can to uphold international protection which is, as the 1951 Refugee Convention says, a shared international responsibility. The rest of the world must follow their example and do the same. 
I recognize that this is politically challenging in some places and that pressure on borders, including in parts of the rich world, as well as on domestic services are under strain. I'm certainly not saying that everyone who shows up should be let in. No, today's reality is that many people, both refugees and migrants, travel along the same routes and the latter often use the only door available to enter, that of asylum. This causes strain on the asylum systems and undermines public confidence. My point, and I can, explain, uh, I can expand on this later if there's interest, is that there must be a process that is fair and fast. And while those in need of international protection should be granted asylum, those who do not meet the criteria should be returned with all their rights and dignity upheld. But focusing only on deterrence, as some countries do with walls, wire, and bureaucratic barriers is not going to resolve the problem. Instead, a comprehensive, route-based approach is needed, which would not only help better control borders, but also address the needs along the route in countries of transit, countries neighboring conflict, and especially in countries of origin to reduce and address the very drivers of displacement. My third appeal to you today, dear members, is for your attention. Please keep your governments focused on more than just the crisis that tops the headlines. For the past two years, it was Ukraine, with the plight of 10 million displaced Ukrainians, now eclipsed by Gaza. Before then, it was Afghanistan, and when large numbers of people were arriving in Europe in 2015, Syria. But who today is talking about these places? or what is happening in the Eastern DRC or in Myanmar? Who is talking about paying any attention to the mega crisis in Sudan, which, is less than one year, which in less than one year has driven more than eight million people from their homes, more than a quarter of those across borders into an already fragile region? Where is the financial support for those people and for the response? The UN appeals from inside Sudan and for the neighboring countries are only 4% funded. I hope you will take this message back to your capitals and that generous pledges will be forthcoming at the international ministerial conference that will be held on the 15th of April in Paris. My fourth and final appeal to you today is for your support and that of your parliaments for peacemaking, peacemaking around the world. It is tough. It requires courage and compromise, two things that are sorely lacking in today's world. Unfortunately, too many people think that conflicts, once quiet, can be contained. But as we have seen with Gaza, with Eastern DRC, with Armenia and Azerbaijan again last year, unresolved conflicts come back and with a vengeance and bring with them enormous human and financial costs for us all. I therefore ask you, your, I therefore ask your focus and efforts to make peace. For it is peace that is not only the vision of the IPU, but is, that is needed most of all today. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tan, for enlightening us on a very pertinent topic about displacement and the impact it has and the fact that um, conflicts actually cause so many uh, refugees to be there, but uh, the, the challenges that you go through as well as you work as UNHCR. 
I would now, members, open the floor for your interventions. If you have any questions to the two speakers who have just addressed us, uh, Bahrain. So I would recognize Bahrain, Namibia, Namibia and Iraq. So we have three at the moment. Malta. Malta, and then? Is somebody writing? OK, so we will go in that order. Can you change it? Germany. Australia. OK, Australia. Please note them. And then you bring me the list. So we will start with Bahrain. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And I thank also the speakers for the information they gave us, although it's uh, it's not really very uh, pleasant about the status of women. My question to Madam Patton, um, how can we really protect uh, peace builder women in the situations that they are facing, the violence they are facing, especially sexual violence? And you've mentioned in your talk a large number of and different situations where really women are facing violence, especially uh, um, sexual violence on ground. Thank you. OK, I, I think in the interest of time, let's hear from everybody so that when it comes to you, then you're able to address all of them. Uganda, uh, followed by Iraq, and then Germany, Morocco. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Coming from Uganda and the, having experienced war uh, for quite some time, I can really feel the huge challenge what other countries are going through. Because when we got over the war in Uganda, it is our neighbors who are now suffering because we are the biggest host country in Africa for refugees. So we have many refugees from South Sudan, from, from DRC Congo, Eritrea, Somalia. So we, can, we feel the pinch of the conflict in our country. And of course, as the host country, it is also giving us a huge burden to see how to cope with these international conflicts. So I really feel that we need to have very strong recommendations how IEPU really can uh, add extra effort in creating a, a special uh, team of peacemakers in this world. Because we, we feel coming here and we don't have, we, we cannot even come up with a, a decision, a resolution because of the diverse divisions that we hold. It becomes very, very uh, uh, worrying because for me, when I come here and we cannot even come up with a resolution to condemn the atrocities that are being caused in this world, it really makes me f fall aback. So I, I salute the studies that have been done, but I would like to see the, the, the strategies and the mechanism that we can adopt that can really enable us pile pressure on all those violent, violent, violent characters who are making this world Thank you. A, a bad place. Thank you. OK. Um, because there are, there are so many uh, Delegations that have requested to take the floor, I would request that uh, when you take the floor, please don't use more than one minute so that every uh, delegation that has requested the floor gets a chance. One minute, please. Um, Iraq, then Germany, Morocco, Australia. Iraq now. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I'm a member of the International Humanitarian Law Committee, and I am head the uh, uh, Human Rights Committee in the Iraqi parliament. I would like to uh, 
uh, denounced the international community for uh, letting Iraq fight ISIS on behalf of the international community. In 2014, when ISIS entered Iraq and um, committed terrorist attacks, with the support of some international entities, that was not due to the situation in Iraq. We are talking about displacement today, but uh, there are various types of displacement. Sometimes uh, people have to emigrate from their countries because of the bad situations. But in other times, international terrorism causes people to uh, be displaced and leave their home countries. We have suffered from horrendous crimes that were committed by ISIS. And I would like to ask the international community, where were you when women, uh, Yazidi women, and Tur uh, Turkmen women in Sinjar and Tal Afar were being burned alive. Where was the international community? These women were raped and they were burned alive in uh, some areas of Syria. We are talking today about human rights viol violations in certain countries. Where were you when these violations were being committed in my country? Until now, we don't know who was funding ISIS, who was supporting ISIS and allowed them to enter uh, into Iraq. Madam President, I, I just have one last word to say. There are 30,000 families in Al Hol refugee camp in an area that is neither governed by Syria nor Iraq nor the international community. It's a no man's land, and this is a ticking time bomb uh, of international terrorism. We are faced with a very dangerous situation, and I would like to ask the international community what will you do to stop this ticking time bomb? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now we go to Germany. Thank you very much for your report. What you describe is really unacceptable for women and uh, young girls during uh, wars. And I uh, recently talked to witnesses from Ukraine who described what they had to be going through uh, from uh, Russian soldiers and uh, another region that's uh, really in our focus uh, is uh, Israel and Gaza. You mentioned Gaza, but I want to mention Israel, and I'm really surprised that you, Mrs. Patton, didn't uh, mention your, your recently published report on violence from Hamas during the 7th October. And uh, my question is, why didn't you mention what you really described in detail in your uh, in your reports, and uh, another question, what can we do to prevent that such things happen ever again? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we go to Morocco, Australia, then uh, DRC. Thank you, Madam President. I wish to thank uh, Mrs. Patton and Mrs. Tan for their valuable presentations. Uh, this uh, meeting comes at the right time because we are going through unprecedented times. We have never in history witnessed this number of uh, international conflicts, more than 50 around the world. These conflicts lead to a large number of displaced individuals. and. Uh, and the situation is particularly difficult for women and children that are uh, harassed uh, and subjected to various types of sexual violence. All the international organizations that have been created after the Second World War to preserve peace and stability are nowadays unable to protect these refugees and uh, displaced individuals uh, due to the high number of, uh, of these uh, refugees. 
But we must be careful and not to deal with these refugees and displaced individuals uh, with uh, 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 double standards. We cannot deal with the displaced from Syria, Africa, Afghanistan uh, in one way and displaced from uh, of other individuals in another way. We have to deal uh, with everyone uh, equally. And therefore, the international community must take a firm stance against the countries that host terrorist organizations, that support and fund terrorist organizations, because this will lead eventually to displacement, to refugees, and to atrocities that are being uh, exercised against women and children. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much, um, Australia, DRC, Peru. Uh, I think Peru will be the last. Thank you, um, Madam President, for the I'm call. I'm informed Lebanon will speak in the next segment. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, can I thank the reporters, um, Ms. Patton and Ms. Tan, for their chilling reports to this august body. And as Ms. Patton was giving her report, I just was chilled to the bone as a woman to hear these words, sexual violence, smugglers trading women, women trading sex for food, forced marriage, rape, gang rape, limited health access. The list of offences to women is so large. And as some of the colleagues who have participated in the question section of this session already have indicated, the reports are not unavailable. The reports are graphic. And I too am chilled at the images that I am seeing from the horror un unfolding in Palestine, but also I am imprinted for my life with an image of a woman transferred out of the back of a car, an Israeli woman, clearly with blood-stained clothing from an attack, a sexual attack. These images are graphic. They cannot be any more graphic, yet we struggle to find a way to advance. You spoke in your contribution, Ms. Tan, about financial fatigue. We've seen the challenges just yesterday in trying to find consensus about a path forward on anything, no matter how urgent the matter might be. So my question is to you, what transformational change can be led by your international organisations to to, to change the education, to change the cultural practices, and where are the men? Where are the men who need to stand up against other men? Where are they? I hope they're all in this room, and I hope they bring about change when they return. Thank you. Um Democratic Republic of Congo, Peru, then we will end with Malta. Madame la Présidente. Madam President, the Democratic Republic of Congo delegation wishes to thank Ms. Patel and Ms. Tan for their um, presentations. And at this 148th Assembly of IPU, we will have noticed that uh, Democratic Republic of Congo has mentioned uh, on a number of occasions um, in a number of statements the, uh, the issue of uh, Congolese and uh, women in particular who have been victims of uh, sexual violence uh, in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is now called uh, the Global Rape Capital. It's where we see uh, uh, enormous numbers of uh, displaced uh, women and people in uh, South Kivu, in the eastern part of Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, the United Nations uh, 
uh, peacekeeping force uh, ha has been uh, present for many years now, but we continue to see um, atrocities against women and children. And on a number of occasions, we said that this is the uh, result of war. This is the result of the Rwandan aggression. It's a result of a terrorist activity through the M23 group, which is supported by the international community. And our question is the following. You have seen what's going on, but what have you done? What has the international community done in the face of these atrocities that have been taking place now for more than 30 years? Merci. Thank you. Je termine. Allow me to finish, uh, Madam President, uh, with the following question. In the face of such atrocities, the DRC has raised this on a number of occasions, but what has the international community done? And what is the point of these meetings if we can't come up with solutions to these problems? Now, members, um, I had mentioned who was coming next, but again, once again, DRC has mentioned Rwanda, and Rwanda is also, uh, is also requesting to speak. Rwanda, you have the floor. Rwanda, can you hear me? You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's unfortunate that the delegation of DRC continues to politicize the work of this assembly as it seeks to hide its government's internal governance and security failures, which we believe are well known. For those who may not know, DRC has more than 260 militia groups in coalition with the government of DRC. Those groups, supported by the government, have made sexual violence as one of the weapons of war, taking advantage of the failures of the government of DRC to provide security to its own people and their property. Guanda hosts more than 100 140,000 Congolese refugees, including women and girls who fled sexual violence acts in DRC and have found a safe place in Rwanda while looking forward to the country to be stable for their return. We call upon the IPU to continue its work through parliamentary diplomacy to contribute to sustainable peace and, and end sexual violence against women and girls in situations of conflict around the, around the world. I thank you, Chair. Thank you. I had, um, I had mentioned Peru. We will end with Malta. Lebanon and Madagascar will begin in our second segment. Peru, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and a very good morning, everybody. Uh, there is a real contempt for life, and uh, being a teacher, it's very difficult to listen to these uh, uh, presentations. Where did we go wrong? What does it mean to be a human being when you uh, see the deaths occurring in these families? What, um, uh, what are the fathers who are bringing up these uh, assassins, murderers, these children? when they get to school? When is it that the teacher goes wrong? When does the teacher say, when you are older, you should become a, a murderer or an assassin? You need to look at the situation. You need to wonder what's going on with these families, what's going on in these homes, in this education. And to conclude, we need to take into account that uh, what Nelson Mandela said on a number of occasions is that education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world. When are we going to start to use it? Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. I would now request the two. No, no, Malta. Oh, Malta. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Malta. Malta, you will be the Thank last to much. take the floor. Okay. Malta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Floyd. Uh, well, my observations, and I have a question also, are the following. We are talking here about also crimes against humanity. When we talk about gang, sexual rape, rape, displacement, forced displacement, extreme violence against children and women, 
and, the, and we know also that the countries involved, they know that they have to adhere to the Convention on uh, Geneva Convention on Armed Conflict. And when they are breaching this international convention and other conventions, we know the consequence. And we have a responsibility here in the IPU, each and every country. We have to know all the information. We have to gather it correctly. To, we have to have the identification of those responsible politicians, those who are involved in conflicts, who are committing crimes against humanity, so that what happened in ex-Yugoslavia, what happened in, 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 in other countries, they have to be brought to justice at the right time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would now give the floor to our uh, speakers and maybe begin with you, uh, Ms. Patton. You press somewhere on the right. Yes, yes. you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for, for all your questions. Uh, I just want to say that we are talking about a, a crime which is rightly called one of the world's least condemned crime and the most silenced crime, and uh, a crime which is very much on the increase. My office has the responsibility of compiling the annual report of the Secretary General, which is debated before the UN Security Council every year. And the report for 2023, which will be debated on the 23rd of April under the presidency of, of Malta, is showing an increase of 49% from 2020. Uh, how, do we prevent, how do we prevent this? To start with the question uh, raised by the distinguished parliamentarian from, from, from Bahrain. I really think that we have to raise the cost of, uh, of sexual violence because currently impunity is the norm uh, and, and justice is the rare exception. And I think as parliamentarians, you have a key role to play to ensure that uh, there is a robust legal framework in place to prosecute any form of sexual violence, that it, it is not cost-free to rape a woman or a man or, or a child, and, and that there is a focus on justice and accountability. This is not a, an inevitable byproduct of war. It's never an accident. It's not collateral damage. It is preventable, and there are, <clears throat> there are many prevention strategies uh, that can be put in place. And my office has also launched a prevention framework that can be used uh, at country level. Uh, with 20 countries, my, my, my office has uh, signed frameworks of cooperation or joint communique on prevention and response. But the challenge that we have is the funding, as my colleague from UNHCR has, uh, has, has mentioned. We provide, we support uh, member states to strengthen justice and accountability. And through UN Action Network, comprising of 25 UN entities, we provide holistic services to survivors of sexual violence. But the challenge is uh, uh, our financial, financial uh, constraints. What, what we need uh, is uh, men wage wars, I think as the distinguished parliamentarian from, from Australia mentioned, but women and children bear, bear the brunt. And we are also seeing, and, and I've made some of these recommendations in my remarks, that funding to NGOs, funding to women peace builders is critical more than, than ever uh, before. Uh, and to, uh, to respond very quickly to why I did not mention Israel, I think we are d discussing about humanitarian catastrophe, and that's why I've mentioned DRC or Sudan or, or Gaza. Uh, my report, as you know, was published on the, my report on, on, on the 7th of October attacks in Israel and its aftermath was, was published uh, on, the, on the 4th of March and I briefed the Security Council on the, on the 11th of March and my findings are very clear. I found clear and convincing uh, evidence of uh, uh, sexual ha violence having, having been perpetrated against hostages during captivity. We have reasonable grounds to believe that such sexual, sexual violence is ongoing, and hence my recommendation for the immediate and unconditional release of hostages. But in different locations, uh, we found uh, that there are reasonable grounds to believe that sexual violence in the form of rape and gang rape, gang, gang rape occurred. How to prevent it? 
In my recommendations, I have extended uh, the support of the office through a framework of cooperation uh, with the uh, uh, government of Israel. I have also made a recommendation for a fully fledged investigation into all the violations that happened on the 7th of October and its aftermath. And now the ball is in the court of the government of Israel uh, with regard to, 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 these, uh, to these recommendations. My office works uh, in the DRC since the inception of the mandate, and we have a very good collaboration with the government of, of the DRC where there is real political will, but it is true that the resumption of hostilities by M23 uh, in, in, in 2022 has, has really if, if resulted in a huge spike. If you can wind up in spike, one minute, please. Uh, it has resulted in a huge spike in the number of cases of uh, sexual violence being documented. My office. Uh, Iraq is another priority uh, country for my, for my office, and I, the office has been working with the government of Iraq to address the needs of the Yazidi women, from legislative reform to holistic survivors to, uh, to, and, and children born of rape in Iraq. I'll stop Thank here, you. Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, now we go to um, Ms. Tan. Thank you, um, Madam President. So UNHCR is a humanitarian agency. So by default, we're dealing with the fallout of violence, war, and persecution. But we all know what needs to be done, all of us. We need political and diplomatic efforts, initiatives to find peace, to prevent war. And in the meantime, we need compassion to help those, to protect those that are suffering. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Barton, but also Ms. Tan for the insights that you have given us as parliamentarians. Uh, because we are running out of time, but I would like you to leave probably with this one question, because we, we are meeting his, here as parliamentarians as uh, we are responsible in our own parliament to advise and oversee the government's work. So we would, uh, we, we would really need to know what it is that we can do as parliamentarians from your side at UNHCR. What do you want the parliamentarians to do in their respective countries? At the same time, what can parliaments do in uh, dealing with uh, sexual violence, and uh, you rightly pointed out in your reports, but we would really want to be kind of uh, forcefully told this is what has to be done by parliamentarians. So that, because of time, you have to live with it, and I, I believe there are more chances to uh, engage, and we will be engaging you on those questions as well. Thank you so much. But there was an issue that was raised by Uganda, which was for IPU, because he asked about uh, what, how IPU can add an extra effort to creating a team for peace building in the world, and uh, that he was uh, uh, somehow disappointed by the fact that we haven't been able to come up with a resolution for the second time in a row. Like I said yesterday, I will repeat my statement, we have ourselves to blame because we talk about parliamentary diplomacy and we want to stand our guns to what we present. That can't be diplomacy and that can't be dialogue. In dialogue, it means you give and take. You can't want all or you can't say, I want all or none. Now when we reach, I can't all or none, that's what happens. If we were able to give in in a few words, we wouldn't be talking about the inability of IPU to come up with a resolution. Thank you so much. We now go to, um, we now go to, um, thank you. So we now go to part two of our, of our general debates high level segment, which uh, celebrates the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions. And I would like to now invite Ms. Mirjana Spojarik, Ega, who is the president of the International Committee on the Red Cross, to join us at the podium. We will have the honor 
to hear her keynote address on the importance of upholding international humanitarian law to mitigate the humanitarian impacts of war, marking the 75th anniversary of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Ms. Mirjana Spoljarek, you have the floor. Yes. Would you like me oh, to you're speak here. The yeah, yeah. Okay. It's your choice. Here or there? Okay. Okay. You can speak there and then come to see. Thank you. Madam President, honorable members of the Assembly, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to address this important international body. And may I start by expressing the gratitude of the International Committee of the Red Cross for the productive and long-standing relationship between our two organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, International humanitarian law is a critical tool and a necessary legal framework to protect human life and dignity when armed conflicts arise. 2024 marks the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions. These conventions are the bedrock of modern IHL, or as it is sometimes referred to, the law of armed conflict. These universally accepted rules seek to provide a guiding framework to limit the conduct of hostilities in order to protect those who are not or are no longer participating in hostilities. The premise of these conventions is simple. There are more than 400 articles all come down to one fundamental agreement. Even in conflict at the worst of times, the core of our common humanity must be preserved. This agreement must be reflected in every interpretation of the conventions. When we see whole cities reduced to rubble, entire medical systems collapsing, children dying from starvation while humanitarian aid is blocked at checkpoints or borders, or families crippled by the uncertainty of not knowing the fate of their missing loved ones, Instead of lamenting, let us remember what the root cause is. The root cause is the flagrant disregard for preserving the spirit within the law of armed conflict, which is to minimize civilian harm. And this is a problem that we all have a stake in overcoming. Tides turn. While today IHL may be applicable to a distant population, Tomorrow, you may look to it. Yet again and again, we see the world stand by and allow the dehumanization of entire populations. And worse, sometimes affirming that while the suffering is deplorable, there are no violations. If you continue to leave the disregard of IHL unaddressed, trust me when I say this law that has until now survived the test of time and saved countless lives will not continue to protect in the future. If we kill this universally accepted body of law by looking the other way, there is nothing that can replace it. As representatives of your populations, it is your duty to stand for IHL, to stand for all victims of conflict and to ensure that the law can continue to protect in the future. I urge you to call out abuses of the law where you see it, because if it feels wrong, then it is wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, the four Geneva Conventions significantly increased the body of treaty law protecting victims of armed conflict. This was possible four years after facing the worst situation imaginable during the Second World War and just as the Cold War began. It is a compelling example of what can be achieved by states coming together, driven by the common purpose to preserve a minimum of humanity even in times of armed conflict. At the same time of an anniversary, we must celebrate the successes of IHL and its track record of saving thousands of lives. 
Yet we all know that although the 1949 Geneva Conventions have been universally joined, they are far from being universally respected. Right now, men, women, and children are suffering, are dying from egregious violations of IHL. And in each of your regions, there is armed conflict, which to those under the bombs may seem unregulated. Over the past years, voices of resignation have therefore been increasing, voices that doubt that IHL actually works, and voices that doubt that the conventions are still adapted to the modern conflicts of today and the types of parties to conflicts we see nowadays. But the Geneva Conventions and IHL more widely have shown that they are as relevant today as they were 75 years ago, and that they are up to the challenges of today's armed conflict, but only when applied in good faith. I look to you as political leaders to ensure that the spirit of these fundamental texts is preserved, because war without limits equals suffering without end. And I ask each of you, in your own state, to push to make the preservation of IHL a political priority. Victims of armed conflict, past, present, and future, are looking to what you and the world choose to do next. Your position, your influence, and the role that you play as parliamentarians put you in a unique position not only to make a genuine difference for the many people who are currently suffering the consequences of ongoing armed conflicts, but also to prevent such suffering from happening in the future. Doing this will be a fitting tribute to all that the Geneva Convention stand for. And the ICRC will continue to support and to assist you in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Ega, for what you have uh, just told us. Now, colleagues, I uh, will welcome the speaker of um, Malta to come take over as I go for other meetings. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, please. Okay, thank you very much. I open the floor now and uh, I request the, the names uh, or with regards to the country. They have one minute to make their own question or observation. And I call Lebanon. Shukran, Hadith Sarais. Awalan, Uid and Uhani, Salib Ahmar Dawli, Wa Ashkuru. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like, first of all, like to thank the ICRC and uh, would like to uh, congratulate them on this uh, anniversary of the uh, of uh, IHL and thank the ICRC for everything that is done uh, for uh, countries throughout the world, particularly my country, Lebanon. Nowadays, we need to think again about IHL. We have to find other ways of approaching these issues in the light of uh, the flagrant violations that are committed. It uh, is necessary to take strong positions on these matters today. And we need to ask ourselves some questions. Secondly, having listened to Ms. Tan earlier, speak earlier, I would like uh, to say uh, a word or two about the situation of refugees. Uh, in Lebanon, we have a lot of Syrian refugees, some two million of them. There are only four and a half million Lebanese people 
We are a small country. These uh, refugees are with us as a result of the conflicts uh, that are tearing the Middle East uh, apart. We are a small country carrying a heavy burden. We do need help. The international community is going to have to do something. Furthermore, uh, Lebanon, despite this difficult situation, has, as a country, try to fulfill its responsibilities and protect these refugees, providing them with moral support as well as uh, material shelter and assistance. Uh, and we also uh, try to uh, deal with any illegal uh, acts that affect us. We do need assistance from the international community to ensure that these people can go home and to do so with the dignity required. Thank you. Madagascar. Monsieur le Président. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving us the floor. I would like, first of all, to thank the IPU for having uh, organized this 148th assembly. We would like, first of all, to make an observation on the question of the Geneva Convention. If the founding fathers of the Geneva Convention were with us today, they would a long time ago have taken decision to ensure that there were changes made to those conventions, uh, both with respect to style and substance. I say this because uh, there are parts of the Geneva Convention that really should be updated and would, be, uh, would benefit from that. The spirit of the Geneva Convention still enjoys full support. However, the reality of life in the field is such that there is some doubt as to the effectiveness and currency of the Geneva Convention. And I would therefore suggest in all modesty and with all due humility to suggest, Madam, that there is a need to work with delegates from countries in conflict or parliaments that are members of this interparliamentary union to actually drastically revise the convention with you. This needs to be done in order to ensure that this convention, which is celebrating its 75th anniversary, is actually in a position to meet current needs. If it were updated, the Geneva Convention would no longer seem to be outdated and would, no, would seem more relevant to today's needs. The Convention has played a very significant role, and that was very clear 75 years ago. However, that was then. I think that now we want to maintain its relevance by updating the articles of the Convention. I will wind up 
by saying that we fully support the spirit of the convention and would happily join in a meeting to update that convention. Thank you. I call Nigeria. I would like you that you keep up with the time so that we cover all the speakers. Nigeria. Madam President, distinguished colleagues, I'm so delighted to be here today. It's very sad that most of us are taking these issues of human rights violations lightly. Every day we record casualties in our respective countries, especially the wearing countries like Hamas, nations like Hamas and Israel. Yesterday, by the leader of my group, that is the Senate president, did make mention that let's put our pride and ego aside and think of what is going on at, at home. Most of us that are here, we are very convinced that we are not coming from where these things are happening. We are in neighboring countries coming to attend this section. Please, I'm pleading with Hamas. I'm pleading with Israel. Let's get a lasting solution. Let's get a lasting solution. The casualty level is, 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 is sad. Every day we lose children, we lose mothers, we lose fathers for no just cause reason. Please, my contribution is as we live here, after 148 section, what do I take home? What have I achieved? IPU. What am I going to tell my people that I came here, we succeeded in harmonizing this resolution or we succeeded in implementing resolution? Once again, Hamas, Israel, please put your pride down and let's face realities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call the last one, uh, Malta. Mr. President, uh, thank you for your intervention. I think we all agree that the ICRC today is a beacon of light in moments of darkness, not today, but throughout all the years that the ICRC has been active in all the different countries of the world, inflicted with conflict and wars. You have been doing something very important, standing up for victims, but it is with heavy heart, I must say, that the international community, including this interparliamentary body, has failed yesterday to unite in the face of hostages who have been for a very long time away from their families, and also in the face of loss of life of women and children in the face and as a result of wars and conflicts. And this inability to reach consensus, Mr. Chair, is deplorable because we are not able to make the obvious, to condemn what is wrong in these conflicts. So as we leave this meeting, this intervention by the, I, by the ICRC president reminds us of our shared responsibility on our shoulders as members of parliament to stand up. And I will close this intervention by thanking you Mr. President, Mrs. Mariana Egger, and all the ICRC, and all the organizations which have throughout the years stood up in moments of darkness to help those in need, especially when all the multilateral and in the, in the international communities have failed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I call the President of the Red Cross to make her concluding remarks. Dear members of the Assembly, uh, again, it's a great honour to speak to you today and I want to thank for the expressions of support. The ICSC has been ha trying to help people affected by armed conflict for 160 years and I assure you that we will continue to do so for another 160 years. But unfortunately, what we see nowadays more and more is the offloading of political responsibility onto humanitarian actors. 
and we have to reverse this trend, and I appeal to you to help us in this. We need political solutions. We need political leaders to come together and forge agreements that would alleviate the suffering, because humanitarian assistance cannot be the distraction from the fact that warring parties are more and more reluctant to negotiate agreements. But we all know that the first steps to political negotiations are always humanitarian. And in this regard, you need neutral intermediaries like the ICRC to maintain these dialogues at all times. We undertake a dialogue on IHL implementation with hundreds of armed groups and all states around the globe. And we continue to rely on your support, the support of your governments to be able to continue that work. Now, on the revision of the Geneva Conventions, trust me, when the law is violated, it doesn't mean that the law is broken. It needs to be implemented. The Geneva Conventions today constitute the strongest international consensus. They have been ratified by all states. We have to preserve and uphold that consensus. But I appeal to you to make sure that the additional protocols which hold complementary precisions to the Geneva Conventions are also universally ratified. There are still 22 states that haven't ratified the first additional protocol of 1977, and there are 27 states that haven't ratified the second. And lastly, yes, the impact of new technologies has to be looked at. And so I am appealing to all of you to, to promote additional legal frameworks that respond to the challenges posed to us by artificial intelligence and digital technologies. We need a common legal framework that sets the rules and the boundaries, for instance, for autonomous weapon systems. These rules are necessary to be adapted in the future to the challenges that we see in modern warfare. Thank you again for your support and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, President of the Red Cross, now I call the, the final remarks by the Secretary General, Martin Chungong. Thank, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, I just want, on behalf of the IPU, to thank uh, Madam President of the ICRC. Uh, it was only uh, a few days ago that we did meet, and uh, during our meeting we uh, uh, agreed to recommit to our uh, long-standing cooperation in respect of uh, IHL. And uh, I believe that the session that we have just had here is testimony to the uh, desire by ICRC and the Interparliament you have, in your concluding remarks, referred to what you think Parliament should be doing in terms of helping uh, ratify uh, or uh, ensure ratification of outstanding commitments. You have mentioned the uh, need to establish legal frameworks, especially in the era of uh, 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 artificial intelligence. These are just pointers to what we can do in the spirit of uh, extended cooperation that we have with the ICRC. And if I may go back to uh, history, uh, this relationship has been around for more than 30 years now. Uh, when uh, in Canberra in uh, 1993, the IPU did adopt a, a foundational uh, resolution that uh, expressed the resolve of the global parliamentary community to work more robustly in support of uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, that uh, resolution has been the framework for our cooperation over uh, the years, and in fact, it did lead to the creation of the specialized body in the IPU that deals with uh, international humanitarian law. Mr. President, you are a distinguished member of that uh, committee, and I must say that they're doing a great job in mobilizing the IPU's uh, support and uh, initiatives in the area of international humanitarian law. We hope that that uh, body can continue to perform its mandate uh, more aggressively 
so that we can see greater respect for IHL in this day when it is most relevant for them to do so in light of the uh, multiplicity of conflicts around the world that put a, bring a challenge to international humanitarian law. So I just want to uh, salute uh, ICRC on the occasion of its 75th anniversary. We uh, hope that this is an occasion for us, ICRC and its partners, to rededicate to the promotion of international humanitarian law in a way that is uh, responsive to the needs and aspirations of the uh, people around the world. So thank you for coming, Madam uh, President. I believe this is an occasion for us to restate here our commitment to work uh, together in the interest of humanity. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Well, allow me to conclude this high-level segment now. Uh, to mark the 75th anniversary. And on behalf of the IPU, I would like to strengthen and retain the full engagement to promote respect for international humanitarian law, and that we are all committed to continue mobilizing parliaments to raise awareness at, on the importance of upholding the international humanitarian law, and also promote respect towards those norms with the aim to protect those affected by armed conflicts. And this brings us to the end of this high segment conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And while we are getting organized, we will be resuming the uh, general debate in just a moment with the list of speakers. May I also take this opportunity to remind that uh, we, the uh, high-level meeting for speakers and deputy speakers on the crisis of multilateralism has started. It is taking place in the Salle Genève across the street in the Annex building. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, distinguished members of parliament, uh, the uh, president of the assembly has just stepped out for two minutes. He'll be back. But uh, we do know that there are some speakers that are lined up to address the uh, assembly. And I will uh, just uh, serve as interim president of the assembly in order not to keep them waiting. So if you don't mind, I will now call on the speaker for the parliament of um, Guinea-Bissau to take the podium and address. Yes, I'm told that you are the next in line. So please. Excellencia. To the action, President. Your Excellency, uh, to the action, President of the Interparliamentary Union, renewed greetings and congratulations on your brilliant election. Honorable Secretary General Martin Chongong, honorable representatives of international organizations present here, fellow parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen. Yesterday, in this room, we witnessed an extraordinary demonstration of internal democracy and freedom of expression by parliamentarians, but which resulted in yet another absolute lack of consensus on basic issues. Not even our president's insistent appeal managed to unblock the situation. Now, this should force us to reflect on the mechanism for combining freedom with effectiveness and responsibility. As parliamentarians, we are called to legislate, to represent, to defend, not to judge. 
we need to change this in order to be increasingly relevant in addressing the issues that afflict our world, whether in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Somalia, Gaza, or in Ukraine. And it is with this in mind that today we condemn the terrorist attack in Moscow, expressing our solidarity with all the Russian people and the bereaved families. Madam President, I welcome the holding of this 148th Assembly of IPU, allowing me a somewhat unusual communication, having to assure that I am, in fact, the President of the National Assembly of Guinea-Bissau, elected by a significant majority of the population of my country and by my peers in the inaugural session of the Assembly. We are indeed a small country, but with a unique history of struggle for independence and democratic openness. And we believe in a future that lives up to our past and our history of resilience and heroism. Unfortunately, today, in this country, which is mine, MPs find all types of constraints. They are prevented from traveling. Citizens are taken to the palace, interrogated uh, and beaten up uh, 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 without any legal proceedings. The parliament is surrounded by non-identified forces, although in uniform and strongly armed. The autonomy of the assembly the financial autonomy uh, has been violated and the salaries of certain MPs, including my own, <laughs> have been withheld since January. Uh, uh, Madam President, Secretary General, colleagues, some uh, of you present here uh, know what I, I'm talking about because you, f you felt it when you were pressured to withdraw invitations addressed to me and to my parliament following calls from our president of the republic to your counterparts in your countries were it not for this affront i would be delighted to tell you about the magnificent magnificent country with simple welcoming people uh, believing in the future and invite you to come and visit us and discover the friendliness and hospitality of our people. But today I feel obliged to share with you this um, uh, somber but real portrait of what we experience on a daily basis. Excellencies, the historic proclamation of the state of Guinea-Bissau in 1973, the independence in literal that independence by nationalists that followed Cabral, uh, was preceded by the creation of the National People's Assembly. Uh, at the beginning of the 1990s, the country adopted democratic rule, formally assuming the separation of powers between the legislative, executive and judiciary power, and chose semi-presidentialism as the system of government. The President of the Republic is therefore the head of state, but the head of government is a prime minister appointed by the President, taking into account the results of parliamentary elections. Now, ignoring, having ignored this provision and placing himself above the laws and the constitution, the president uses the military and the security forces as well as private militia to aggravate his inability to coexist with a government and parliament led by party with other than his own party. All those that are familiar with the local reality consider this to be uh, unconstitutional uh, not legal, uh, and it was actually a coup d'etat. Uh, I could mention the decree of dissolution of the parliament, the role given to the uh, general uh, prosecution to um, contradict the president. But, dear colleagues, I'd rather say that we all uh, know that human rights are the cornerstone of any democratic and civilized society. The first condition to build a, a state of law a, with the rule of law. So it is unacceptable in a state that claims these attributions, the representatives of the people are treated as enemies of the state, subject to sanctions because they have just done what they were supposed to do. Freedom of speech and the freedom of manifestation are uh, fundamental rights and they uh, cannot be denied by the will of those that are in power. So we have to wonder what type of democracy are we building when those that were elected by the people are replaced by those that serve an individual alone. Time has come to take a firm and equivocal stance in favor of human rights and democracy. Dear colleagues, I conclude by saying 
that we are committed toward justice and liberty. And I uh, exhort I, uh, IPU to uh, not accept uh, to uh, the uh, um, violation of human rights on the, in the name of uh, stability. We cannot stay silent before injustice and oppression. This home, this house, should be a house of the legitimate representatives of the people. History should judge us not for our silence, but for our courage and determination in facing injustice and violation of, of human rights wherever it takes place. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jimo Ibrahim from Nigeria. So we continue the debate by calling on Jamaica. Jamaica, and after Jamaica, we call ECOWAS, and after that, the island, Iceland. Iceland. So we take Jamaica. General Secretary, President, Excellencies, and Distinguished Delegates, Jamaica is pleased to be invited to participate as an observer in this, the 148th Assembly of the IPU. On behalf of the people and government of Jamaica, and in my capacity as President of the Honorable Senate of Jamaica, I wish to extend commendations to the IPU for its long-standing commitment to the promotion of democratic governance, institutions, and values. As a previous member of the IPU, we can attest to the value of the work of this organization, and our participation in this session is an important step as we reassess our membership within this august organization. The theme of this year's assembly, Parliamentary Diplomacy, Building Bridges for Peace and Understanding, is timely, as it is becoming increasingly apparent that parliamentary diplomacy is necessary to address pressing global issues such as climate change, <clears throat> poverty alleviation, international peace and security, as well as conflict resolution. Through constructive engagement and dialogue, we can harness the collective wisdom and resources of our various nations to tackle these challenges effectively. It is for this reason that Jamaica continues to play an active role in facilitating dialogue and cooperation within the CARICOM region to promote and restore peace and stability to Haiti and throughout the region. In this regard, I acknowledge the presence of other CARICOM members here at this session, including the Bahamas, which has recently rejoined the I IPU. I note the presence as well of Trinidad and Guyana. And Guyana is an interesting situation because Guyana presently faces an existential threat to its, ten, to its territorial integrity and will require the attention of this organization sooner rather than later. Jamaica continues to uphold strong democratic principles which feature the con consistent transfer of power and features an effective, effective bicameral parliamentary system with a strong independent accountability framework. The parliament is a critical pillar of a well-functioning democratic society, and we are keen on ensuring diversity and inclusiveness, which are both crucial pillars for building bridges and fostering greater understanding, as well as the provision of dynamic and effective leadership that can better respond to the needs of all our people. Within our parliament, we have a high level of female representation which is one of the highest percentages of women elect to parliament. Of note is that both the leader of government business in the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives are women. Just last year, 
we established a bicameral caucus of women parliamentarians with the goal of facilitating networking, building solidarity, and promoting constructive dialogue on issues of particular importance to women parliamentarians as well as to their professional development. The establishment of this caucus supplements ongoing efforts to promote greater progress towards gender equality within our parliament. I'm also pleased to highlight that our parliament also includes persons with disabilities and a significant number of young parliamentarians. The engagement and participation of youth within the work of parliament and issues relating to the governance are fundamental to Jamaican, Jamaica's development and is a key focus. Since 2003, we have established the National Youth Parliament, which provides young people with the opportunity to contribute to the work of the parliament and to offer concrete recommendations and solutions. President, in closing, the support of the IPU will be essential in offering training and capacity building for, parliament, for parliamentarians to effectively discuss and address the plethora of issues being faced, especially by developing countries. As a small island development, de developing state, Jamaica understands the importance of multilateral cooperation in confronting the several shared challenges. We remain committed to working closely with our international partners, including the IPU, to promote dialogue, fostering understanding, building bridges, and a more peaceful and prosperous world. As we say in Jamaica, one love. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this stage, I think the, the Secretary General would love to react to uh, have a response to Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I just, I just wanted to uh, say a few wa words in the wake of uh, the uh, statement that has just been made by the Honorable President of the Senate of Jamaica, just to say that on behalf of the IPU, we welcome you to this precinct. We see that uh, from your intervention, you feel like fish in water. You're very comfortable with this environment here. And uh, we hope that it's just a question of time for you to rejoin this fall as a full-fledged member of the global parliamentary community. That having been said, we have taken good note of uh, your commitment to work with international partners, including the IPU, to help address the challenges that are facing the global community, as well as uh, the national community of Jamaica. We are committing to pursuing that cooperation with you and your fellow uh, countries in the Caribbean, the small island develop, uh, developing states, because you are a strong constituency within the IPU, and we want to make sure that you have that platform to articulate your views and aspirations. So, Mr. President, thank you for coming uh, back into this organization. We hope to formalize your, the relationship in the very near future so that you can become the or you will resume your rightful seat within the organization. I also want to use the opportunity to respond to the Right Honorable Speaker of Guinea-Bissau, who in his statement referred to the tremendous pressure that the democracy process in Guinea-Bissau is uh, uh, feeling now uh, on account of uh, various violations of uh, uh, human rights and the rule of law. I just want to say that his very presence here is a testimony to what the IPU stands for, pushing back on those who want to push back on democracy. He has come here in spite of all odds, and I believe that uh, his statement has been well uh, noted here. This community of parliamentarians uh, will continue to work to make sure that democracy in uh, Guinea-Bissau does not falter, that parliamentarians and parliaments in Guinea-Bissau are adequately protected so that they should perform, they can perform the role that is incumbent on them by their constituents. And so I just want to reassure the speaker of uh, Guinea-Bissau that we are in solidarity with uh, uh, his uh, parliament and himself personally, and we hope that together we can uh, 
find ways of uh, reinforcing the democracy process in uh, the beloved country of Guinea-Bissau. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, the Secretary General. We now call on ECOWAS to respond. Thank you. Mr. President, honorable speakers, distinguished parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, it is my greatest pleasure to address the 148th Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union. Since my election as Speaker of the Parliament of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, our two institutions have collaborated and built deep solidarity around universal values such as human rights, democracy, the rule of law, gender equality, peace and sustainable development, as well as free and fair elections. It is very important to note that our participation in this assembly signifies the green warmth and cordial relations that exist between the ECOWAS Parliament and the IPU. In so doing, I must use this platform to thank the IPU leadership for the successful record and proven ability in steering the affairs of this august body to attain success and be more effective in addressing the challenges confronting the world. Mr. President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the selected theme for the general debate, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding, fits perfectly with the objectives for which our parliament, the ECOWAS parliament, was founded. Amongst other things, the ECOWAS parliament was established to contribute to the promotion of peace, security, and stability of West Africa. By strengthening representative democracy, cooperation, and solidarity with like-minded institutions, the parliament would have achieved the goals of building a sense of common destiny for the promotion of democracy. To achieve these goals, the ECOWAS Parliament has found parliamentary diplomacy to be a viable tool that could be used to increase mutual understanding and valuable means of dialogue in advocating for solutions to diverse issues. As elected representatives of the people, parliaments constitute uniquely legitimate democratic institutions with a central role to play in all governance processes. Today, parliaments around the world find themselves to be very integral in governance and instrumental in securing successful implementation of protocols and agreements aimed at securing global peace. Parliaments play several key roles in peace building, including overseeing the implementation of peace agreements and becoming sites of national dialogue. Therefore, the ECOWAS Parliament finds parliamentary diplomacy to be an important aspect of the regional conflict prevention and peace building mechanism. Excellencies, since its establishment, the ECOWAS Parliament has actively engaged in parliamentary diplomacy, particularly in conflict areas within the sub-region. Notably, played a pivotal role in fostering peace within the Mana River Union, MRU, which includes Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia during a period of fragile stability. Additionally, the ECOWAS Parliament provided valuable recommendations for resolving the first political crisis in Guinea-Bissau following the dissolution of the National Assembly. We are aware that there are still issues, and I believe the ECOWAS Parliament will definitely do everything possible to resolve those issues. These efforts complement numerous fact-finding and mediation missions I have had the privilege to lead across various member states. Leveraging on legislative bodies as instruments for fostering international harmony and cooperation through parliamentary democracy is fundamental to building bridges for peace and understanding. Through legislative initiatives, policy advocacy, and oversight functions, parliamentarians can contribute to the implementation frameworks 
that enhance peace, economic growth, and development around the world. Mr. President, honorable parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, notwithstanding the benefits that can be derived from parliamentary diplomacy, escalating geopolitical tensions, regional conflicts, and power rivalries pose significant challenges to parliamentary diplomacy, hindering cooperation, dialogue, and consensus building among nations. The rise of authoritarianism, populism, and democratic backsliding in various parts of the world threaten the principles and practices of parliamentary democracy, thus undermining its legitimacy and effectiveness. Moreover, limited resources, funding constraints, and capacity gaps within the parliamentary institutions may impede the ability of lawmakers to effectively engage in diplomatic initiatives and address complex global issues necessitating innovative approaches and resource mobilization. Excellencies, to mitigate this, it is quite relevant that parliaments leverage on collaboration with civil society organizations, NGOs, and grassroots movements to augment parliamentary dip dip diplomacy efforts and foster greater citizens' engagement, accountability, and responsiveness to societal needs and aspirations. The ECOWAS Parliament is open to sharing experiences on such par partnerships, as well as promoting ideas that will enhance parliamentary diplomacy and the benefits that can derive therefrom in building peaceful and prosperous societies. As I conclude, it is my hope that this assembly will advance our collective goal of an integrated, developed, and prosperous world, where parliaments play an increasingly important role in peace initiatives and conflict prevention efforts. Once again, it has been my pleasure to address this assembly, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, ECOWAS, and I'm sure you are, you are actually you've been doing a very good job there and from that sub-region. This concludes the list A of presiding officers of parliament. We now start with list B. First speakers for, and for my delegation that I will call is from Iceland, followed by Japan and Portugal. So we can see that Iceland should come over to make response and present their papers. So you have the floor. Thank you. Dear colleagues, it's fair to say that we're currently witnessing a grimmer outlook in international relations than we've seen and experienced in decades. We stand in the face of a full-scale war in Europe, horrific conflicts in the Middle East and other parts of the world, and polarization yet again on the rise. Given these circumstances, it's essential to reflect on the origins of the United Nations and the multilateral system, which emerged from the aftermath of a devastating war. The primary aim of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was to serve as a crucial tool in preventing future horrors and is an important instrument for building bridges for peace and understanding. We have witnessed troubling backsliding of human rights and the rule of law around the world, including in Europe. Consequently, Iceland is committed to prioritizing the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all individuals, as we will seek a seat on the UN Human Rights Council for the period 2025 to 2027. At the core of our foreign policy lies a commitment to upholding human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. These values serve as the foundation for our alliances and guide our actions within international organizations. In position of leadership, we consistently advocate for the protection of individual rights and freedoms. Moreover, our positive experiences 
drive us to maintain a robust stance as advocates for gender equality and the empowerment of women. The global context we live in has evolved significantly in recent times. Hence, it is more crucial than ever that we work together to reverse the serious backsliding of human rights we have witnessed lately and secure the universal human rights of all people, regardless of race, religion, beliefs, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity. It is imperative that we uphold the core values of democracy, freedom, and human rights, while defending the principles of freedom of expression and assembly. Dialogue plays an important role, even when we disagree, as the absence of dialogue only serves to protect human rights violators. In my view, this is the essence and importance of the IPU. Our collective efforts here hold immense potential to benefit people worldwide. Dear colleagues, unfortunately, we seem to be failing at that here in recent assemblies. It must be our shared goal to change that for the better, to enhance the lives of individuals across the globe. I thank you. Thank you very much for that brilliant contribution. I, I will now call on uh, uh, Japan to make a response. Japan, you have the floor, please. Distinguished colleagues, it is an honor to speak to you today as the leader of the Japanese delegation. When Japan was struck by the Noto Peninsula earthquake in January this year, messages of sympathy and offers of assistance poured in from many countries, regions, and international organizations. I express my heartfelt gratitude for your warm support. IPU discusses many global issues, ranging from natural disasters to the impact of AI. The realization of peace is among the most important of these. Peace is more than just the absence of armed conflict. The peace that we should aspire to is a condition in which the life, health, and basic human rights of each individual are protected, and people are able to enjoy fulfilling lives in an environment of mutual respect. The international community should pursue the realization of this vision by promoting mutual understanding and giving ear to diverse opinions. I believe that parliamentarians have an extremely important role to play in this process. Among ourselves, parliamentarians can engage to real and candid discussions that reflect the diverse views in our countries without being bound to the position of our respective governments. Engaging in frank exchanges foster mutual understanding, nurtures trust, and helps building long-term relationships. These are the advantage of parliamentary diplomacy. Long-term bonds among parliamentarians are and if affected in charge in changes in national leadership and function under all conditions as the glue that binds countries together. In particular, these bonds can act as a safety mechanism when peace is under threat and dialogue between governments is difficult. Based on this belief, 
Over the years, I have fostered close relationship with members of parliament, including especially female parliamentarians of numerous countries such as the United States, China, and South Korea. I conclude my reiterating that as representative of people must play a central role in the effort of the international community aimed at realizing peace. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you very much. That paper actually emphasized the importance of peace and dialogue, and that's very key to what we need at, international, at the geocentric politics. Uh, the next floor now, we be giving to Portugal to make response. Portugal, you have the floor. Thanks. Senhor. Mr. Uh, uh, Chair, dear colleagues, allow me to speak in my native language. Now I'm representing my country, Portugal, and allow me to speak Portuguese, the most spoken language in the southern hemisphere of the planet. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Colleagues, we are parliamentarians. We are very honored to be parliamentarians, to represent the people that entrusted us to defend their interests. We are therefore used to come to understandings, to take stances on issues, but then have the ability to negotiate, to find points of understanding that allow us to solve people's problems. And if this is the rule, then it should also be present in another sphere, the sphere of parliamentary diplomacy. We MPs, we act not just on the national sphere, but more and more in the international sphere. Because we do have this capacity, this experience, to negotiate in-house, then we should bring this uh, to the international sphere to negotiate and find answers to conflicts. And if this is the rule, now at this moment in time, with so many conflicts in the world, m our responsibility is even higher. Be it the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, be it what happens in Sahel, be it uh, what is happening in Yemen, Sudan, or in Gaza, we must have a say and we must work on it. That is why it is so timely to be here at this forum, the forum on the, uh, by excellence on parliamentarism and multilateralism, where parliamentarians for, from over 100 countries gather to discuss the world's problem, problems. And we have the theme today, building bridges for peace. But, dear colleagues, I will be very honest with you. We are failing. Failed. We failed. Because, porque se nós queremos. because if we want understandings, we must all have the capacity to negotiate. How is it possible? I mean, a humanitarian disaster is uh, taking place in Gaza. There are uh, hostages, Israeli civilians that are detained. Humanitarian aid does not get there. Uh, there is death and blood every day. And we, here, together, are unable to understand to come to an understanding, to appeal to the solution of this situation. You have a saying in Portuguese that says, do what I say, don't do what I, as I do. Now, this is, this is the bad example we are giving to the world. This is a crisis of multilateralism. We knew that the United Nations were in a crisis. They cannot understand, come to an understanding on anything. Now it seems that IPU uh, is doing the same. 
we are here uh, to gather to discuss, but we cannot come to conclusions because we are not willing to find an understanding. Uh, Mr. Ch Chair, MPs, the Portuguese-speaking countries came together and there was a consensus uh, among our delegations. First, show solidarity towards the Russian people and Russian authorities uh, for the terrorist attack that they suffered. A terrorist attack should always be condemned, whether it happens in Lisbon, whether it happens in Paris, in Bali, Moscow, or in Israel. And an Israeli attack is always an Israeli attack, and it should be condemned, and the Portuguese-speaking countries condemned that attack. We also showed our solidarity towards the parliament of Guinea-Bissau, because we are parliamentarians. We have to show solidarity towards or all situations as such, uh, namely this one that is close to us because it's a Portuguese-speaking country. But we hope we could go further in this assembly and that it would be possible to find the so-called uh, points of understanding that say that parliamentarians uh, advocate building bridges and agreements, understandings. But we were unable to do it, but I hope we learned the lesson so that in six months, again, here in Geneva, we may be, may be able to do it. Otherwise, the world loses, the world that we are representing here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that brilliant presentation, which I emphasized more on innovative strategy to come to peace. And of course, the speaker also emphasized on humanitarian disaster that is causing human insecurity, you know, particularly in the area concerned. Uh, we will now call on Mozambique to present the papers. Mozambique, please, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Chair, Your Excellency. <clears throat> President of the IPU, President of the 148th IPU Assembly, Excellencies, the Presidents or Speakers of the Parliaments here present, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is with particular honor that I address all of you present here in this noble hall on the occasion of the 148th General Assembly of our organization, the IPU. Your Excellencies, we have gathered in this Magna Assembly to discuss a subject of great importance for the whole world, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding, whose deliberations and reflections uh, augur well for the future of our peoples and countries. Conflict prevention is recognized as a privileged mechanism of intervention by the international community in the management of conflict, in which preventive diplomacy develops three types of action, targeting the causes of conflict, preventing confrontations from becoming violent, and finally, containing the expansion or escalation of violence. And we, parliamentarians, have our share in this field. On the other hand, there is a growing and the realization that given the characteristics of today's world, the issue of security, whether national or international, should not be limited to the military dimension and the risk of war, but should extend to all the major threats to human survival, the affirmation of collective personal personalities, and the protection of their dignity. Defense against military aggression is, of course, a vital component of security. <clears throat> We live in time of uncertainty, not the uncertainty of millennial anxieties or anxieties that anticipate countless tragedies, but the uncertainty that comes from the growing complexity of the environment that surrounds us and that has rendered obsolete all the intellectual frameworks that arrogate to themselves unshakable certainties about the paths of history. Uncertainty therefore means openness and not closure. Your Excellencies, people don't need to think alike but they do need to understand the thoughts of others. When we make room to healthy dialogue, we may not have the same opinion, but we all are 
We should always be willing and open to establishing forms of cooperation in which everyone contributes their opinion in some way. Learning to live together is one of the greatest lessons human beings learn. Good coexistence is a necessary condition for harmonious, productive and happy life. We are different beings and this is what enriches us and makes us more human. We are convinced that peace is imperative for promoting social and economic development. However, without justice there is no peace. Peace, like justice, has the good of every person and everyone in mind in a demand for order and truth. When peace is under threat, justice is at risk at the same time. Allow me to quote the words of St. John Paul II in a brilliant speech on the occasion of the World Day of Peace. And I quote, Peace of all is born of justice for each. No one can shirk such an important and decisive obligation for humanity. It involves every human being according to their respective competencies and responsibilities. It is in this sense that we can safely say that peace goes hand in hand with justice. Your Excellency, if we say that peace goes hand in hand with justice, we can bluntly conclude that there can be no sustainable development without peace and no peace without sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, the Assembly of the Republic of Mozambique is no stranger to the crucial role assigned to all legislative bodies in building and maintaining peace, as well as guaranteeing the well-being of the people, and to this end has passed a number of laws to fulfill this goal with emphasis. And before concluding my speech, allow me to share with you that uh, on the 8th of December 2023, Mozambique launched the celebrations of the 30th anniversary of multi-party parliament, an important milestone in the history of our democracy, which allows all Mozambicans to live together regardless of their political party affiliation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, uh, we should keep to time because uh, we still have a lot of speakers. Uh, the floor now belongs to uh, Norway to make the paper presentation. Please kindly keep to time, please. Thank you. Dear chairperson and colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear he, she, and them. In these uh, times of increasing polarization worldwide, stemming from various so so social devices, we recognize the signific significant impact decision making holds both, both on a personal and on an organization level. As a selected representative, it's critical for us to advocate the unity and understanding within our society. Our primary task is combating the polarization, is to acknowledge and embrace the diversity among us. As parliamentarian, our duty is to enact laws and politics that promote equality and strengthen human rights. Parliamentarians worldwide can significantly contribute to promoting peace and international security through engagement in global in initiatives and dialogue, strengthening international agreement and fostering collaboration are the key to resolve conflicts and prevent war. To face to, to facilitate dialogues between parliamentarians for peace, our parliament has a numerous tools that is disposal, including formal and informal channels, interaction with other countries and their politicals, and collaboration with different organizations, especially human rights organizations. The Norwegian parliament, regardless of uh, political membership, has the responsibility to oversee the government's agreed-upon political lines are upheld, both nationally and internationally. 
While maintaining a cooperative relationship with the government, we also ensure vigilant oversight to uphold laws. Politics and international agreement with the commitment to promote equal peace and safety. Recently, efforts in the Norwegian Parliament have focused on strengthening the regulations surrounding government's transparency and accountability. Reflecting our com commitment to fostering public trust, political process, and in, in these processes, all parties are active, and in times of difficult discussion, they stay uni united when we're facing the press. Parties utilize these opportunities to reduce polarization around politicians. We have also witnessed use of artificial intelligence, spreading fake news and ma manipulating public opinions. It is imperative that we swiftly establish uh, nation and international regulation uh, governing the ethical use of artificial intelligence to prevent further polarization. As parliamentarians, we must ensure that human rights are upheld both online and offline. Regulating AI is critical to prevent conflicts, riot and unfair treatment, as unchecked AI context could uh, intensify social instability. As essential to remember that behind every IA lies human responsibility and human commands. We are currently implementing various forms of IA content labeling on the internet, promoting transparency and accountability. This is particularly vital as human can use AI to significantly ensure uh, and affect political standpoint and organization's context. Given uh, AI, uh, we must al always remember that it comes from human minds. In conclusion, as we navigate to the complicated of ever changing, our ever changing world, let us remember our duty as parliamentarians to uphold the values of equi equality, peace, and transparency. Thank you very much for having the floor. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. We now call on Malawi to present uh, the paper. Thank you. Malawi, please, you have the floor. We honor the President of the Assembly, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I feel greatly honored to stand before this Assembly, which is meeting here in this beautiful city of Geneva, to contribute from a Malawi perspective to the topic, Parliamentary Diplomacy, Building Bridges for Peace and Understanding. Your Honor, I stand here on behalf of the Speaker of Malawi National Assembly, Right Honorable Catherine Godanihara, who is currently preoccupied with parliamentary duties in Malawi and therefore is not able to be here physically, but she does wish us well. Your Honor, we gather today under the noble banner of peace, and the presence of peace allows individuals, families, and communities to reach their full potential. Unfortunately, currently, the globe the global landscape is marred by rising tensions, political polarization, and conflicts that are threatening the very fabric of our societies. Your Honor, it is saddening to note that in just 2023 alone, there have been 56 states around the world that have been experiencing armed conflict, according to Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Recent examples include Sudan, the Gaza, region and the DRC, 
which have been marked by continuous escalation of violence. It is disheartening, therefore, Your Honor, to see that these conflicts have resulted in serious humanitarian crises, civilian casualties, and widespread destruction of infrastructure. Your Honor, the IPU has rightly chosen peace as its focus for 2024, because balance by their very nature are platforms for dialogue and compromise. Yet within these wars, we strive to find common ground, and this very act embodies the speed of peacemaking. Your Honor, respecting and protecting and promoting human rights and fundamental freedoms is essential to preventing violent conflicts and ensuring peace and security around the world. Parliaments play a crucial role in addressing polarization and corruption to promote peaceful coexistence through legislative, representative, and oversight roles. Parliaments can introduce and pass laws which promote unity, inclusivity, and social cohesion. This legislation could include anti-discrimination laws, hate speech regulations, and policies promoting diversity and tolerance. Your Honor, as Parliament of Malawi, we have a responsibility to address the root causes of conflict within our own borders. We know that inequality, discrimination, and the lack of economic opportunity breed resentment and instability. As one way of promoting peaceful coexistence, Parliament of Malawi has, in the last four decades, played a key role in promoting peaceful coexistence in our country. For example, in 2004, our parliament played a crucial role in ensuring that constitutionality be adhered to by rejecting an illegal constitutional amendment bill. The bill had proposed an extension to a presidential term. Then in 2012, our parliament helped to uphold constitutional order upon the demise of a sitting president in Malawi. And then in 2020, Your Honor, following a disputed presidential election in 2019, our parliament played a key role in passing legislation that was needed to effect court decisions that eventually led to a presidential election in 2020. You, our, members, our members of parliament, Your Honor, also address polarization by actively engaging with their constituents to foster understanding and cooperation among diverse communities in Malawi. The members of parliament do organize meetings, public forums, and community events to promote dialogue, address grievances, and build trust in our communities. In 20, 2022, Your Honor, our parliament passed a peace and unity bill which provides the legal basis for the establishment of institutions which are mandated to promote and protect peace and conflict prevention in Malawi. Your Honor, these examples I've cited do demonstrate that the Parliament of Malawi has been very active, actively involved in resolving political disputes in our country in a peaceful and democratic manner. As a result, Malawi is rated as one of the most peaceful and democratic countries in the world. Your Honor, Mr. President, parliaments can also help to ensure that gender perspectives in peace building, mediation, and dialogue are integrated in our laws and policies, which do support gender equality at the regional and international level uh, through ratification of international protocols. For example, Malawi has ratified the Southern African Development Community Protocol on Gender and Development. We have also ratified the protocol to the African Charter on the Rights of Women and Af in Africa. And lastly, we have ratified an international, at international level, uh, Malawi is a party to the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Your Honor, Mr. President, the Parliament of Malawi has also, over the years, supported budgets that enable Malawi to participate in, in international peacebuilding missions. For example, as we speak, Malawi has deployed a peacekeeping mission in the DRC uh, in Africa. 
Your Honour, Mr. President, Parliament of Malawi has several good practices in the exercise of parliamentary diplomacy which have contributed to the fostering of dialogue, cooperation and collaboration with other countries and international organisations. Some of these please include... Please kindly conclude, please, because of time. Thanks. Mr. President, in conclusion, therefore, let me emphasize on the need for parliamentarians to foster dialogue between communities and advocate for inclusive policies at the local, regional, and international levels. This can be achieved through legislative oversight and the representative laws. By achieving this, parliamentarians can contribute to building a more inclusive, harmonious, and resilient society where conflicts are resolved through dialogue and cooperation. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now invite Republic of Korea to make, to present the paper. Please kindly keep to time, please, because there are more speakers to come on floor. Thanks. Honorable Chair, dear colleagues, my name is Shin Hyun Young. I'm a member of the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. It's indeed an honor and pleasure to stand before you on behalf of the ROK delegation. Colleagues, the polarization, conflicts, and politics of hate are threatening the security of our parliaments and their members. Recently, in the Republic of Korea, the opposition leader and an MP from the ruling party were attacked, illustrating this growing danger. Threats to democracy and peace are emerging both within and outside parliaments. Along with geopolitical tensions and trade wars, the digital revolution, climate change, and infectious diseases have become new sources of further divisions around the world. Today, I want to share with you how parliaments can serve as a bridge fostering peace and understanding, and how we can collaborate toward this goal, specifically as a young woman politician and a medical doctor I wish to highlight two critical roles that parliaments need to focus on. One is to mitigate social polarization and discrimination by actively promoting the political engagement of women and youth. The other is to strengthen new forms of security, such as public health security. For politics, to alleviate social polarization and discrimination. It is imperative to ensure a high level of diversity in our parliament. I believe that stronger representation of women and youth in parliament is crucial. According to recent statistics from the IPU, among all MPs around the world, only 27% are women and a mere 2.8% are under 30. Given that half of the world population is either women or under the age of 30, both groups are significantly underrepresented in parliament. The ROK faces the same challenge. Although there have been discussions about nominating a certain percentage of women candidates, for electoral districts, progress has remained slow. Globally speaking, it is encouraging that international institutions such as the IPU and the UN are promoting meetings of women and youth groups. The ROK National Assembly has been actively involved in the agenda development and discussions in relevant international gatherings. The increased political particip participation of women and youth not only empowers them, but also lays the solid foundation for democracy and peace. 
Next, I'd like to address the role of parliaments in shaping and developing new concepts of security. Recently, new dimensions have been added to the traditional concept of security, as seen in climate security and public health security. Through the COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned the importance of global cooperation in health security. These new forms of security threats, whether they are health or climate crisis, transcend national borders. The first impact the most vulnerable countries and communities, ultimately affecting us all. As a medical doctor, I have paid keen attention to how climate crisis affects global public health. The increase in natural disasters directly harms the human body and adversely affects food and housing stability as well as sanitary conditions. It has become evident that the climate crisis is also linked on increased in infectious diseases. Therefore, we now need to develop systemic responses based on comprehensive and specialized research, which requires international cooperation in raising funds and exchange human resources. Against this backdrop, it is also the role of parliaments to promote a common understanding of pressing global issues and build consensus on cooperation to address them. Direct communication among MPs from around the world can clarify the perspectives and positions of different countries. In this regard, the IPU General Assembly provides extraordinary opportunities for parliamentary solidarity as we exchange views on diverse areas, including politics, security, science and technology, health and climate. The ROK National Assembly remains committed to leading the effort to strengthen parliamentary diplomacy and cooperation within the IPU and other international parliamentary forums. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much more importantly for re-emphasizing the consequences of human insecurity. This concludes the general debate for this morning, and the debate will continue at 2.30. Thank you very much. Director General, if you can come join us here, please.
Okay. Um, colleagues, let me welcome you to this very special segment with Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, who is the Director General of the World Health Organization. He is accompanied by his team here, as you can see. Uh, one of them is here and others on the other side. And incidentally, in his team, there is also uh, the Director for Security Health Preparedness of the WHO, who happens to be Dr. Stella Chungong, the wife of our Secretary General. <laughs> so she's there. This is our, this is the person who makes him work hard. So now I would like to uh, recognize your presence, Mr. Director General, and it is a great pleasure for the IPU to have you our ministers. And um, we understand that WHO has always been a long-standing partner of the IPU and a key one to bring scientific and parliamentary communities closer together. It is more important than ever that we have evidence to make informed decisions, but also to counter misinformation. At this very moment, not far from here, WHO member states are negotiating an international agreement for pandemic preparedness. We know that, unfortunately, after a crisis, the political momentum is quickly lost as other pressing issues are prioritized. But after the COVID-19 pandemic, we should know better. Health systems collapsed, societies were locked down, and inequalities came to the fore. Our countries need to be better prepared, but we also need a more equitable and fair global system that puts people's lives and well-being at the center. I would like now to welcome you, Mr. Tedros, to, uh, to address the assembly. And you may address the assembly from the podium. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Madam President. The Honorable Tulia Axen, President of the IPU, Secretary General Martin Chungong, Excellencies, Honorable Members of Parliament, dear colleagues and friends. It's an honor and pleasure to join you today. As the former Ethiopian parliamentarian and minister myself, I have seen firsthand the power of parliaments to enact the laws, regulations, and budgets that make a real difference to the people we all serve. By the way, every time I join you, I feel nostalgic as a former parliamentarian. Almost 76 years ago, in 1948, the nations of the world converge on a seminal instrument of international law that has made a huge difference to global health, the constitution of the World Health Organization. The WHO constitution was the first legally binding document to affirm the right to health for all people without distinction and an end in itself. But it goes further by saying health is fundamental to achieving peace and security. The authors of the WHO Constitution recognized the intimate link between health and peace 
a link that remains more relevant than ever in our troubled world today. Of course, neither health nor peace can be achieved by any single country or agency alone. It requires strong partnerships like the one WHO has with the IPU. WHO values enormously its partnership with the IPU, where we see as key for translating political commitments and policies into action to advance the right to health and the foundation of peace. In 2018, WHO and IPU signed the MOU that committed us to work together on several key issues, including universal health coverage, global health security, and the health of women, children, and adolescents. The following year, the IPU Assembly adopted a resolution on achieving universal health coverage by 2030 in Belgrade. Together, we have developed several tools, including handbooks on UHC and global health security and an online course on the use of taxes. We have also undertaken joint activities to engage parliamentarians in implementing universal health coverage, strengthening global health security, and advancing the health of women, children, and adolescents. Based on that experience, it's clear we need to do more. Today, my friend Martin and I will sign an MOU to renew the collaboration between our organizations for the next five years. This agreement commits us to working together in four priority areas, universal health coverage, global health security, health promotion, and reducing health inequities, especially in relation to sexual and reproductive health and rights. These priority areas are critical for realizing the right to health. We also decided to add three cross-cutting areas of work, including mobilizing parliamentary support for sustainable financing for WHO, the pandemic agreement, and our work on climate change. In addition, we will establish a joint focus group to address the health of migrants and refugees. As you're all aware, this is a big year for parliaments with elections in 72 nations. And it's a big year for global health. At the World Health Assembly, which starts in just nine weeks' time, WHO member states are scheduled to consider legally binding agreement on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. But we cannot forget the painful lessons the pandemic taught us and the scars it left. More than 7 million people lost their lives to COVID-19. And those are just the reported deaths. We know the true number is much higher. The pandemic also caused, as you know, significant social, economic, and political upheaval. The key issue now is whether we will learn the lessons the pandemic has taught us so we don't repeat, we don't repeat them next time. And there will be a next time. The next pandemic is a matter of when, not if. The pandemic agreement aims to address the gaps and challenges all countries faced and to ensure we are better prepared for future pandemics. This new agreement would be an instrument of international law similar to the many other accords and treaties that nations have agreed, the Geneva Conventions, 
the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and so on. However, there are currently two major obstacles to meeting that deadline of approving the pandemic agreement. The first is a group of issues on which countries have not yet reached consensus. They are making progress, but there are still areas of difference that need further negotiation. None of them are insurmountable, and if countries listen to each other's concerns, I'm confident they can find common ground and a common approach. The second major barrier is the litany of lies and conspiracy theories about the agreement. That it is a power grab by WHO that will cede national sovereignty to WHO and give it the power to impose lockdowns or vaccine mandates on countries. Unfortunately, some of these lies have been spread even by members of parliament and in some cases by heads of government. Let me be clear. These claims are utterly, completely, and categorically false. This agreement is being written by countries, for countries, and will be implemented by countries in accordance with their own national laws. The pandemic agreement will not give WHO any power to dictate policy to any country. In fact, it says exactly the opposite. Let me read to you Article 24, Paragraph 3 of the negotiating text of the pandemic agreement. I quote, nothing in the WHO pandemic agreement shall be interpreted as providing the WHO Secretariat, including the WHO Director General, any authority to direct, order, alter, or otherwise prescribe the domestic laws or policies of any party, or to mandate or otherwise impose any requirements that parties take specific actions, such as ban or accept travelers, impose vaccination mandates, or therapeutic or diagnostic measures, or implement lockdowns." End of quote. Colleagues, as a former parliamentarian, I find it difficult to understand how elected officials could mislead the people they're supposed to serve on this issue, either knowingly or unknowingly. If unknowingly, it's negligent not to be properly informed. If knowingly, it's a deliberate deception that puts at risk the health of future generations and the social and economic stability of nations for some short-term political goal. We urge parliamentary parliaments to be aware of these issues and to support the ongoing negotiations. The pandemic agreement is the cornerstone of a new, stronger architecture for global health security that WHO and our member states are building. This includes key actions for stronger governance, stronger financing, stronger systems and tools, and a stronger WHO. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, let me leave you with just two requests. First, we seek your support for the finalization of the pandemic agreement and pending its approval, its ratification and implementation. And second, we seek your support for action on the priority areas we have identified in the MOU that Martin and I will sign in a few moments. Universal health coverage, health security, 
health promotion and addressing inequalities. My thanks once again to my brother Martin and to all of you for your support for WHO and for global health. WHO remains committed to supporting every country and every parliament with the evidence, science, and technical support you need to make the right to health not just a slogan, but a reality for your people. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros, for those very powerful and um, very good insights for all the members to consider. Um, members, we don't have much time, but we have received a list of uh, some countries that would like to take the floor, and they'll be given one minute each uh, to address the, their questions to the um, uh, Director General. Secretary General, do you want to yeah. go ahead? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam President. Uh, we have a number of uh, MPs who have uh, uh, indicated that they would like to put questions to uh, the Director General of WHO. And uh, without further ado, I think we can call on uh, uh, the uh, Chair of the Advisory Group on Health, the IPU Advisory Group on Health. She's, she's somewhere here. Yeah, please. One minute. Can you press the button and wait? Okay, I think, is it red? It's green. Okay, now okay. it's red, you can speak. We're working now. Thank you. Um, my name is Lorraine Clifford Lee and I'm the chairperson of the Health Advisory Group. And thank you for your update, Dr. Tedros. The IPU Advisory Group on Health is regularly briefed by the WHO on the Pandemic Accord. We discussed it on Saturday in our meeting, underlying the importance of reaching an agreement and of engaging stakeholders in the process. We also noted the, challenge, the challenging context and the many crises affecting national health systems and limiting countries' capacities to respond to emergencies. It was also clear during the COVID-19 pandemic that preparedness also requires equity at all levels. My question to you is, how will the pandemic accord help bridge the equity gap within and between countries when it comes to preparedness and response capacities and access to treatments and vaccines? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I suggest that uh, we take all the questions and then let uh, Director General Tedros respond to them en bloc, if you do agree. So we, uh, with that, I now see uh, from my list, Dr. Faustin Ndugulile from Tanzania. Are you in the room? Yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, and thank you, uh, Dr. Tedros, for that uh, very good and uh, well and concise uh, uh, presentation. My question is that uh, COVID-19 has shown that countries need to find ways to scale up funding for emergency response. It often means that money is moved from some programs to others. What can parliamentarians do to ensure that funding for the vulnerable populations, and especially women and the children, is safeguarded and the health systems continue to take the needs into account in the case of health emergencies? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ndungulile. I now recognize uh, the member from the Seychelles, uh, Mr. Waven William. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My question to Dr. Tedros is, climate change is an existential threat, especially for small island states like the Seychelles, amongst others. Climate change is also impacting disease patterns and increasing the risk of outbreaks. 
epidemics and pandemics. How is WHO addressing the complex linkages between climate change and health? And will the pandemic agreement contribute to our capacities to tackle climate change threats? I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I now call the member from Bahrain, Hala Hafez. Uh, yes, you have the floor. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Mr. Tadros, for your uh, speech. Um, we know that women are hardly um, hit during crisis, either in many different ways, direct and indirect ways. And around the globe, we are also witnessing reversal of human rights, and especially women's rights. In many countries, harmful practices such as female genital uh, mutilation continue to heavily impact girls' health, education, and lives. What is the evidence of fight against these practices? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hala. Uh, I, I, I will entertain two more questions. I, I see that uh, Malta has asked for the floor. After Malta, the Netherlands. And then, please, we would like to give the floor to Dr. Tedros to respond to those uh, questions that have been raised. So Malta, uh, Netherlands, and uh, in the interest of gender equality, I will call on Burundi. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. And also, thank you for the collaboration with IPU. Uh, the motto of IPU for democracy for everyone goes in very well with the work that the WHO does. I was very happy to learn that one of the pillars of the uh, pandemic uh, agreement will be fighting inequalities, especially SRHR. And uh, I have two questions. One, uh, how will the pandemic accord change and be important? What difference will it make, especially for island states? Here at IPU, we have a number of island states. Obviously, Malta is one of them. So how important is it, maybe more than other uh, countries, um, for island states to sign this pandemic uh, agreement? Because of the economies of scale, we saw that during COVID, um, the, the vaccines arrived in Malta on the same day that they arrived in other EU member states because there was uh, common uh, procurement. The second uh, point is, I think that we need a parallel information campaign effort, a joint uh, effort by WHO, IPU and members of parliament. I know that your, your efforts at the moment are all on negotiation, but in parallel, you need to give us the tools to inform the public so that we fight this misinformation. Thank you. Thank you, member from Malta. I call on uh, the Netherlands. Thank you, uh, Chair, and also thanks to Dr. Tedros uh, for informing us on this. Uh, I recognize very much what Dr. Tedros said about the misinformation and the uh, uh, fear of certain parliaments and also populations uh, that the national sovereignty uh, is, uh, is um, well, declined by the uh, treaty for, uh, for the WHO. So thank you for your extra factual information, but also the question, and that relates to what Malta already also asked, how can you also help us to fight the disinformation and the misinformation that is uh, spread around the world, I fear, uh, around the pandemic uh, uh, treaty? Thank you very much, uh, Netherlands. Uh, now, uh, Burundi uh, will be the last speaker at the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for giving me the floor. I have just one question for the Director General of the WHO on vaccines. In our country, three and a half month old babies get three shots, two on a thigh, on one side, and the third on the other thigh. And that can be rather traumatic for mothers. It might be nice to find ways of combining all these vaccines so to avoid traumatizing babies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Burundi. Merci. Merci, Madame la Députée. 
Uh, now I will uh, pass the floor to uh, Dr. Tedros to fill those questions that have been raised. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all uh, honorable members of parliament for the questions, very important ones. Uh, so I will try to be very brief. I think uh, <laughs> Martin is pressed for time. Um, on the first one, on the pandemic agreement, um, as you rightly said, equity is very important. Uh, and during this pandemic, during COVID, if there was one problem that everybody has actually witnessed is the lack of inequity, uh, the lack of equity. So COVID has actually exposed the deep inequity that we have. And the next pandemic agreement, I mean the pandemic agreement, should actually address equity. And that, uh, many member states actually agree on that. And what we're doing from our side is to address equity, and I hope in the pandemic agreement um, this will be strongly positioned. One is strengthening the capacity, the local produ production capacity in the South. Uh, of course, we don't wait until the pandemic agreement is signed. Uh, we have already started taking uh, action. Uh, for instance, the mRNA hub in South Africa is helping boost local production in the South. And also, the hub we created in the Republic of Korea is assisting in training for local uh, production. That's one. And the second solution with regard to equity is uh, allocating some amount from global production that can go to um, uh, countries uh, from, from the South. And of course, they are negotiating on what percent uh, should be allocated, but I hope that will be one of the uh, solutions that's being considered for the pandemic agreement. So it's a combination of two things. One is boosting the local production, and second is allocation of certain percent from global production to uh, provide equitable uh, distribution of vaccines, diagnostics, or treatments. On funding, the second question, um, of course, uh, as you rightly said, women and children should be at, at the center. And if women and children are going to get priorities. I know you understand that this, is, this needs a political com commitment from government. And this also includes you parliamentarians uh, during allocation of funds to allocate special funds for women and children. I think uh, safe, doing it that way, as you rightly said, can safeguard women and children, identifying them as a priority. On climate change, and um, uh, especially with regard to uh, small island developing states, as you know, a climate crisis is a health crisis. And the climate change is already creating several health problems. Actually, the most compelling reason to understand that climate change is happening now is to understand its impact on health. As you know, children, asthma in children is increasing. As you know, cardiovascular disease is increasing due to climate change. And as you know, Malaria and dengue are spreading in areas that have never been um, the case in the past. So the most compelling reason for climate change is actually in, in, in health. And that's why we had the successful climate and health COP28 in COP28, thanks to UAE. Uh, last December and tried to increase the awareness of the link between climate, climate and health. And we're 
um, uh, we have several initiatives to address, especially with focus on seeds countries. As you know, the whole world is affected by climate change, but seeds countries are disproportionately affected. And on women and reversal of human rights, especially on female genital mutilation, as you rightly said, we're disappointed to see that some countries are even trying to reverse what they have decided in the past, the, pan, the ban of female genital mutilation. Um, but this again, I think is in the hands of the parliament. I think you have to take this seriously because the health implication of female genital mutilation is very clear, well documented, and the only solution to this is actually you. And as I told you as a former parliamentarian, I think it's the political intervention at the parliament level and having a strong bill to ban FGM wherever it is, is very, very uh, crucial. Then fighting um, inequality, especially on um, uh, the, um, uh, how the pandemic accord can support small island states. What is already as, as a text, as a draft text in the allocation, which I have said earlier, I don't want to repeat, will address the challenges we face with regard to equity. And if what's already proposed is, is agreed, it will be good for many low and middle income countries. And it will also be good for the small island developing states. And the proposals that are coming now in the draft document with regard to equity, the two issues I raised can actually address the, the problem, including for, for, for seeds. Um, on the involvement of members of parliament, especially in fighting misinformation and disinformation, uh, I had a meeting with um, your fellow uh, member of parliament, uh, from the UK, Dan Carden, and we discussed about the misinformation and disinformation and how it's affecting the pandemic agreement. And he asked me exactly the same thing. How, how can we get the tools from you so that we can fight misinformation and disinformation wherever it is? And thank you so much for your commitment to that. I take the question as actually your expression of con commitment to help in fighting misinformation and disinformation. And we will send you all the documents you need through IPU and uh, other, other channels. So you have all the facts at hand and fight the misinformation and disinformation so we can have the pandemic agreement on time by May 2024. Uh, then on uh, the vaccine shots, um, uh, of course, as you know, the way we deliver vaccines differ based on the type of the vac vaccine. And as you rightly said, it could be difficult for uh, mothers, especially seeing their children, especially having uh, injectables. Um, I think simplifying the delivery methods uh, is, is important. Uh, and um, uh, I hope that's also what um, actually um, uh, companies uh, are doing to simplify the uh, delivery methods. And we will take that as uh, a recommendation. But I, I fully understand. So these are the questions, and thank you so much. Sorry if I have forgotten some, some, some uh, questions, but uh, <laughs> we'll continue uh, the dialogue and keep in touch and working with you closely. And thank you so much for your continued support and, and leadership. Merci beaucoup. Oh la la. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Tedros. I think that there's a meeting of the minds here uh, judging from the uh, discussions that have just taken place. And uh, let me take you up on that word you used, dialogue. Let's continue the dialogue. Uh, I think that it is very important that this dialogue be ongoing. And uh, I am very glad that it is reflected in the 
MOU that we are going to be signing in a moment. And I think that we need to identify entry points uh, for uh, continuing uh, that dialogue, whether it is within the framework of the IP or WHO, uh, we should exploit all those entry points. And uh, I am looking to the uh, next World Health Assembly. I hope that we can find space within the uh, World Health Assembly where we can bring uh, parliamentarians together with WHO officials in order to continue to dispel these lingering doubts that exist in terms of the pandemic treaty. We, have, uh, we are going to commit to uh, taking the treaty when it has been concluded to the national level. And I think that it's important that before it goes to the national level, those doubts are completely or almost completely dispelled. So my ask to you, Dr. Tedros, my dear brother and friend, is that uh, we continue that conversation in the framework of the World Health Assembly. And if it is possible, like we used to do in the past, we could have a special segment where we would invite uh, prominent uh, members of parliament to engage in a dialogue with uh, officials of the WHO. I think this is something that would help uh, dispel those doubts. And I also think that I, they mentioned the tools, and those tools are very important. We need uh, to um, design specific uh, information materials that are uh, targeted at Parliament so that they can have something that they can easily digest, and uh, this will help uh, dispel the, um, the, the, the doubts that are lingering here. So thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for uh, coming here. I hope that uh, we can continue that uh, dialogue including in the context of the next World Health Assembly. So without further ado, maybe we go ahead now and sign that agreement. I still, I'm still committed to signing the agreement with you. <laughs> so we will sign it to um, uh, certify our commitment to continue our work together. I, I am informed, Dr. Tedros, that we have a, a distinguished guest who yes, would like me. to. Yeah. So I'm pleased to introduce Ms. Cristina Almizadu, representative of the WHO Youth Council and co-chair of the Youth Council Working Group on Universal Health Coverage. The Youth Council serves as the voice from 22 different youth organizations. This is the first ever structure of this kind at the World Health Organization, providing advice on global health and other developmental issues from a youth perspective. The Youth Council health priorities are broad with a specific focus on maternal health, climate change, non-communicable diseases, universal health coverage, youth leading for health, and the pandemic agreement. Over to you, Christina. Now. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Um, I'm honored to be here today on behalf of uh, the WHO Youth Council, expressing our commitment to ensuring access to quality essential health services for all. My mission today is to hand over a letter to you, Mr. Tedros, uh, Dr. Tedros and Mr. Uh, Chongguk, urging to mobilize uh, parliaments and reinvigorate their support to legislate for and invest in health for all. 
in line with commitment made by adopting the IPU uh, resolution on universal health coverage in October 2019. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've come to the end of this uh, segment, and I just want to thank all of you for being patient with us, and uh, I know you're hungry, and uh, so we'll not uh, hold you back here. Please have a good lunch, and uh, we'll resume proceedings at uh, 2.30 prompt. Bon appétit to all of you.